see that picture, put it into a search engine, and see if it shows up on multiple mm. profiles. That's a red flag that that person oh. is not real. Same thing, put their texts into an internet search engine and just see if it shows up on multiple dating sites. Oh, but that's another that's sign. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. Some experts say that this bill still isn't enough. Do you accept that criticism? There's been a ton of confusion from the CDC. Can we try to clear some of this up? Is America safer today with the Taliban in charge of Afghanistan? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Good morning. Welcome to you today. Nice to have you with us. We wanted to surprise Ellie and make her wish come true. What do you think about coming to visit us? Yes. There's only one thing that people are saying. Like, you are. <laughs> 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 As many as 70% of employees reported working from home this past year, and now some companies say employees can work remotely as long as they want. In many offices, even before the pandemic, cleaning crews sanitize desks daily. But can we say the same for our home offices? You know, the ones we share with kids, pets, and our meals? So how dirty is your work from home desk? To find out, we're using this device. It tests for invisible living cells in short, it's a germ meter, and the higher the number, the dirtier the surface. I swab my keyboard. This is where I let my fingers do the walking. Mouse, conveniently located next to my open food. And desk. All right, here we go. It's not promising when there's actually visible dirt on the swab. Next, I prep the samples by breaking this tube. It releases a reagent that mixes with whatever's on the swab. I know the results are gonna be bad, because I've cleaned this area exactly this many times. In a matter of seconds, I got a result of 1,513. For reference, hospitals are expected to keep their high-touch surfaces below 100. We don't expect to have the same level of cleanliness in the average home, but 1,500 indicates my keyboard could use some cleaning. My mouse, slightly lower at 1144, but my desk? Whoa, this one by far, 7,506. To help me out, my generous teammates on the consumer investigative team agreed to swab their workspaces. Many of their numbers were even higher than mine. Ooh, gross. 3,200 on my keyboard. <gasps> 3,285. America, please don't judge me. 12,743. <laughs> Is this bad, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> it's not great. <laughs> Producer Jamie swapped her workspace. 7,319. Disgusting. And her daughter's. 5,736. Gross. Out of the three surfaces, keyboards were the germiest, with an average of 6,115. We took a trip to my desk at 30 Rock to compare. It's cleaned a lot more often, and it even has this sign that says, this area has been cleaned and disinfected. I do the same three swabs. Again, the keyboard is still the dirtiest compared to the desk and the mouse, but at 251, it's far cleaner than any of our home offices. Now that we know our home offices are pretty germy, let's go further and find out what kind of bacteria is on these surfaces. 
We collected samples from our home workspaces with this special swab and took them to Columbia University microbiologist, Dr. Susan Whittier. We are in suspense. What did you find? We found a lot of different types of bacteria, um, most of which are normal. In total, she identified eight different types of microorganisms living on our desks. Most are safe and commonly found on our skin, water, indoor plants, soil, and dust. But one of the work areas that was swabbed did have a potentially pathogenic bacteria. That was your desk, and it was uh, loaded with Staph aureus. That's right. My desk at home was apparently covered in a bacteria called Staphylococcus aureus. What does that mean? It certainly could cause an eye infection. It causes skin infection, soft tissue infection. So that was rather surprising. I need to go leave and clean that right now. <laughs> that is just, that's just disgusting. That is so gross. It's right there. Fortunately, it's easy enough to reduce the number of germs at your workspace. Dr. Whittier says clean it twice a week with soap and water or one of these, a disinfectant wipe. And don't just wipe down your desk. Focus on the high touch areas like your keyboard and of course, your mouse. While it might be convenient, don't eat at your desk. Not only is it cleaner to eat at a kitchen table, but it also gives you a break from the workspace. While pets are cute, they can also be dirty, so try to discourage them from lounging on your workspace. Come on, Colombo, let's go. A reminder that cleaning is important, but... I don't want anybody to be a germaphobe. We're surrounded by bacteria, we're covered in bacteria, it's normal. Now, to be clear, we did not test for the presence of any viruses, including the one that causes COVID-19. And as a reminder, the CDC says any surface transmission of the virus is unlikely. It dies very quickly on surfaces. But this was just more of a reminder that our home offices could use more cleaning, probably my home office, much more than we are giving them. Well, a couple oh, yeah. things. So that staph of whatever yeah, it was yeah, yeah. that you have in your office, that's mm -hmm. not staph infection, is it? Because that's serious. Well, it's my own bacteria. Okay. So unless I have a cut and I'm vulnerable, then it could turn into something, which is why we took a Clorox spray and wiped to that whole space afterwards. So it was what a little happened? scary to find that out, but it's it's not like super, super dangerous. Maybe it came from your cat sleeping on your keyboard. Yeah. <laughs> Thankfully, that was my producer's cat at his apartment. Oh, okay. Yeah. Your, your team of producers, by the way, that's a, that's a filthy good bunch. Sports. Yeah. <laughs> no, no good, sports. good sports. Thank you. Because yes. they're working so hard. Yes, 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 show. yes. They haven't left their desk. Now, this pandemic has turned you into a scientist. So my question is, did you go back and read swab after you cleaned? And was it better after that? 100%. I wanted to know, like, how much of a difference does cleaning actually make? So that desk, when I swabbed it, it was 7,500. I went back. Cleaned it, just a straight wipe. It was yeah. fine. Disinfectant spray would work just fine. Alcohol it went down to 168. So cleaning oh, wow. absolutely does have an impact. We just don't want people to be germaphobes. We need germs, bacteria. It's good for yeah. us. It helps us boost our immune system. Right. But, you know, once or twice a week, wiping things down is probably better yeah. than not Same. at all. Stay connected and stream the news you need with Xfinity x -Fi. Our top story is unfolding right now. The fast speed you depend on and a reliable connection for all your devices, whenever and however you watch with Xfinity x -Fi. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Let's go. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Take a rapid COVID-19 test twice a week at work. That's now an option for hundreds of employees at GenPak, a digital consulting company in Texas. I am going in to get my test. Nichelle Boylan says it was a no-brainer to opt in. A quick swab of the nose and within minutes, she learned the result on her phone. If it's positive, she heads home to isolate before coming into contact with coworkers. If she's negative, she goes into the office. Does it give you peace of mind? Total peace of mind. 
we want to return to work, but we want to do it safely. And this helps us. What is this doing for your employee population? Uh, it's improving their morale. It's improving their confidence that when we say, look, we really have safety protocols that allow you to come to office. Now, some scientists say programs like GenPax should become standard practice so employees can safely return to work without fear that their coworkers could be asymptomatic but infectious. Harvard epidemiologist Dr. Michael Minna has been advocating for frequent rapid testing since the start of the pandemic. What do you think is the biggest misconception when it comes to rapid testing? That rapid tests are not accurate. When used frequently, say twice a week, they will be very sensitive. He says these rapid antigen tests will catch people who are sick before they even know they're sick, which means they stay home and don't spread the disease. Is that the most effective way to get back to what we had pre-pandemic, to reopen businesses, to reopen schools safely? Absolutely, even if spread is ongoing in the community. He says while GenPAC's program is a good first step, businesses and even schools should adopt at-home testing. We saw it firsthand back in January. So now you're going to swab your nose. Uh -huh. For this test made by Abbott, simply swab your nose, insert it into the card, and results appear in about 15 minutes. This is definitely giving me pregnancy test flashbacks. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> to see how effective these tests can be in the real world, Minna launched a study with Citibank in February, asking 6,000 employees to test themselves at home three times a week. The results are uploaded to an app, which tells them whether or not they can go into the office. What have you found so far? Almost immediately, we began finding uh, infected individuals who would have otherwise gone to work not knowing that they were positive and transmissible that day. The Citibank study will be completed in June. Meanwhile, GenPact is also finding asymptomatic cases. The CDC says using workplace screening to stop the spread of virus is most effective when combined with masking and social distancing. The agency recommends weekly testing, especially for businesses like hair salons and manufacturing plants, where employees are close together. Testing plus vaccination together, I think is the way to bring the economy back in a much faster way. And it's very easy. I literally took this test this morning, got the results in 15 minutes it's from my negative. kitchen table. Negative, yes, <laughs> one line, <laughs> negative, yes. Well, GenPak's testing program is voluntary. The company says about 70% of its workers are taking part, and soon they're going to be able to do these at home twice a week. And as we talked about, you test positive, you're already at home, you isolate, you get a confirmation PCR test after that to let you know you really are positive. That way, you're not at risk of coming into the office mm -hmm. and spreading it to everyone else before you know that you're sick. Something like this has to happen before everybody can go back to work. I mean, there has to be some mechanism in place for sure. So, yeah. so, so Vic, can anybody buy these these tests, these home tests, anywhere? Yeah. So the FDA has just given emergency use auth use authorization to two of these at home tests. So now they can be purchased over the counter. This one, the Binax Now test made by Abbott, uh, they're available in Walgreens, CVS, twenty four bucks for a box of two tests. The box really simple, so looks bad. something like this. Yeah. My, my question is, how accurate is it? Well, so the key is they're most effective. These rapid antigen tests are most effective for detecting people when they are infectious. The CDC says then you got to take that second step and get the PCR test for confirmation. But the whole point is this is a screening test. So Dr. Minna is saying that had we been doing this testing from the beginning, we would have lowered our community infection rates a lot quicker. I have two relatives who, oh, sorry, who um, they thought they had allergies. Yeah. Right? So, and it turns out they had COVID. Oh. So, I mean, those are the kind of cases where you think, oh, you take a Benadryl and go to work. Right. Right. What if you've already been vaccinated, though? I mean, do you still need to do this? So you wouldn't, but here's an occasion where you might consider it. Let's say you're going to a big event, a wedding. Yeah. Because the science right now says even if we're vaccinated, we're not going to be sick or, or um, have severe symptoms, we right. could still be infectious. So if you take a test like this, you're vaccinated, but you find out you might be carrying the virus and infectious, you stay home from that big mm -hmm. event. So that's yeah. an instance where you might see people wanting vaccinated mm -hmm. individuals to still take the test. Yeah, my daughter's getting again. married yeah. this, this summer and almost... I think 95% of everybody's been vaccinated, mm -hmm. but we're still going to require masks. Oh, masks, exactly, yeah. yeah. And if you if these were more affordable, it'd be easy to have everyone test, too, yeah. and you'd have another layer of security. Mm. That's that's yeah. one question I was going to have. I mean, $24 for, for two, I feel like you almost wouldn't take the test unless you're really feeling something. Exactly. But so many people are anti 
or asymptomatic. Yeah. So, I mean, should, do you still recommend taking the test even if you don't have any symptoms? Yeah, so that's the reason that, you know, Dr. Minna and others say you need to make these things more affordable and they need yeah. to be paid for either by the government or through your workplace mm -hmm. so people are more apt to take them. Sure. $24 for two is still a high it's amount, right. you know, yeah. right. Yeah. It's yeah. nice to have if you These are places we may not be able to visit for a while. Come with us as we take you there into our incredible world. Jerusalem, Zion, the true shining city on a hill. Home to one God, three religions, and many more names. In Arabic, Al-Quds. In Hebrew, Yerushalayim. For Christians, a place of pilgrimage. We are walking where the Bible says Jesus himself walked 2,000 years ago. To visit Jerusalem is to travel back in time, into history, and yet in this holy citadel, facts and faith are not always friends. Hello. Good to meet you. Good to Father see you. David Grenier is from the Order of St. Francis here in Jerusalem meets us at the house where Jesus is thought to have held the Last Supper. Take this and divide it among yourselves. When the Romans came, they destroyed the temple and they destroyed this place also. But they rebuilt it on the same place. The evidence, he says, is in the very walls. This is a city where every stone has a story. This size of rock could have come from the Temple of Jerusalem. This became the most important place spiritually for, uh, for the first Christians. And while you can never be confident anything here is what it's said to be, these are reputedly the very steps Jesus would have taken on his way to Gethsemane on the eve of his crucifixion. Normally, only the Pope is allowed in here. The first thing that strikes me when I'm here is how peaceful it is and the torture that Jesus was going through when he was said to be here. He knew what was coming. The whip and the crown of thorns and the nails. He knew everything, but he stayed here. And this is where Judas kissed and betrayed him. According to the Bible. The church of St. Peter built, some believe, on the ruins of the palace of the high priest where Jesus was interrogated. This is where they say Jesus would have spent his last night, the night before his crucifixion, in a dungeon, a cell. To see Jerusalem for yourself is to truly comprehend how all these biblical events happened in an exceptionally small area. Father David takes me to the old city where Jesus was sentenced by Pontius Pilate. Today we see the mosques. In the time of Jesus, it was the Temple of Jerusalem. So in the place where we stand was the Roman fortress Antonia. That was the place where Pilate would have been. This is the first of the Stations of the Cross. That's the first station. Mm. So now we are quite literally walking in the footsteps of Jesus, following the 14 Stations of the Cross. So we've reached the fourth station. Yes, that's the place where Jesus met his mother. So this is the fifth station? Yeah, that's where Simon of Cyrene helped Jesus to carry his cross. Important footsteps over here, because we're entering the Basilica of the Holy Sepulchre. This is the church which believers say contains the final four stations of the cross. Underneath the altar, we can touch the rock of Golgotha, in the place where the cross of Jesus was. And the Edicule, thought by some scholars to house the remains of Jesus' grave. For Christians, the holiest shrine of all. The very place, it is said, where Christ's body was brought after the crucifixion. To come here for the first time and to imagine that this is where Jesus was resurrected, it's awe-inspiring. But did events take place exactly where they happened thousands of years ago? There's no scientific proof. 
That is perhaps the very definition of faith. Next, we'll explore how looking for the truth is never easy. Good morning. Welcome to Today. Start your day with us every morning. Get your daily dose of news on the go with the Today Podcast. <laughs> and stream today anytime you want. Today, all day. Every day. Wherever you are, today is there. Let's go. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Stay connected and stream the news you need with Xfinity X5. Our top story is unfolding right now. The fast speed you depend on and a reliable connection for all your devices, whenever and however you watch with Xfinity X5. King David's city, where Solomon's temple stood, where scripture says the holiest of holies housed the Ark of the Covenant. The city visited, it is said, by Muhammad himself in a single night. Myth and mystery are in the DNA of Jerusalem. Yet that does not stop archeologists here looking for the truth of the Old Testament. Searching with the scripture in one hand and a trowel in the other. Deep underground in Jerusalem, archeologists hope to find biblical clues beneath the layers of Roman occupation at the Western Wall. So we're underneath the men's prayer area in the Western Wall uh, Plaza. The men are standing above our heads. They think they're standing on floor. Well, they're not. They're hanging 10 meters in air. Pilgrims thousands of years ago we from joined Doran Spellman to, to witness All what has been the world's North. biggest historical and dig. And you can imagine this was open to the sun. It was a beautiful pilgrimage road here. In the time of King David, people walked this road to the Siloam Pool mentioned in the Bible. There was music, there was incense, there were people singing. All of this is written about in Jewish texts. And now I'm reading Nehemiah chapter three. And he built the wall of the Shiloach pool next to the king's garden, as far as the steps that go down from the city of David. I've got something to show you here. Look at that. Wow. What's down there? That is an access route into the underground sewer of the city. This ancient tunnel is built at the time of King Herod, around 2,000 years ago. If we look at the Bible, this is Exodus chapter 39. It's talking about the robe worn by the high priest of Israel. And it says they also made bells of pure gold and attached the bells all around the hem of the robe. So the high priest is walking over here somewhere and a golden belt tears off, goes through the drain, ends up in this tunnel, and 2,000 <laughs> years later, we pull it out of the ground. But in these layers of history, is there evidence of biblical Jewish kings? David or Solomon? If there is, says archaeologist Doran ben Amy, he has not found it. The Bible never intended to speak history. It has its own uh, purposes, but not telling you history. King David, Solomon, like nothing is here. Archaeologist Israel Finkelstein says finding proof in the past the is not the easy. The question is whether Jerusalem was this golden age city uh, in the 10th century BC. So we are dealing with memories, tales, myths. The excavations have sparked controversy. These tunnels are beneath Palestinian homes. Above ground, one of Islam's holiest sites, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. In places, the search for answers beneath this city is unsettling communities above ground, looking for the religious truths of the past. 
disturbing people in the present. Now we leave Jerusalem, 20 miles out of the city, to a remote hilltop where archaeologist Yosef Garfinkel has found another kernel of evidence. So we're entering a city in the kingdom of King David. Yes, and this is the biblical city of Sharaim. Your very big discovery was actually through something quite small. Olive pits, yeah. Olive pits. Just olive pits. Helped you and, figure this out. And they gave us the dating. The dating is 1000 BC. Okay. So olive trees like this lived here already 3000 years ago. It's amazing that uh, little olives can lead to a discovery so big. The fortress town overlooks the Elar Valley and a famous biblical battle. This is where David fought Goliath. This is the, exactly the location, yes. So if we'd been standing here 3,000 years ago, from here we'd have been able to watch David battle Goliath. Sure. Was King David here? Of course, like every story here, some say yes, some say no. What is not in doubt is that around the same time, Jews were writing about who they were. Books which became fundamental to the way many of us see ourselves today. And for that, we are heading deeper into the desert, over the vast salt lake called the Dead Sea, to this desolate valley, where a secret was hidden for more than 2,000 years. It was to become one of the most important biblical finds of all time. This, the very place where, in 1947, texts that became world-renowned as the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in these caves by a Bedouin shepherd boy. And he noticed this open. He wanted to find a golden coins, or a gold treasure, or a diamond, or whatever. But he didn't understand that what he found are much more than gold and diamonds. Ten jars, some of them were broken. And when he opened one jar, he saw three scrolls. A Jewish tribe, in terror of the Romans, placed jars containing precious parchments in the caves, planning to return later. They never did. It's incredible to imagine them in here, hiding those early biblical texts. But that's not the end of the story. Every fragment is important. It's like opening the oldest Bible in the world. This laboratory, home to 25,000 fragments of the scrolls, is still discovering hidden words in the parchment. Do you see, it says here, Zamra. Zamra means uh, to sing. Wow, Th this is a word that you never knew was there. They are using advanced image technology designed to detect patterns in the darkness of space. So you think about the people sitting in the cave in the desert with no tech at all, and then we are investigating them with the super high-tech technology. Utilizing the light spectrum and highly tuned cameras, the computer highlights even blackened scriptures. The bottom parts are completely illegible. And today, they are reading scrolls that are like coal. You can see the words mystically uh, revealed. Yes. 70 years after they were found in a cave. It is amazing to read now all the black parts of the bottom of the scrolls which were connected to the soil. Today we can read them with all this technology. It is amazing. A biblical jigsaw puzzle gives some clues about the Old Testament texts and about the times in which Jesus lived. Next, we travel across the desert, as did those three wise men, to the place where Jesus was born. Good morning, welcome to Today. Start your day with us every morning. Get your daily dose of news on the go with the Today Podcast. <laughs> Boom. Boom. And stream today anytime you want. Today, all day. Every day. Wherever you are, today is there. 
Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Some experts say that this bill still isn't enough. Do you accept that criticism? There's been a ton of confusion from the CDC. Can we try to clear some of this up? Is America safer today with the Taliban in charge of Afghanistan? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Some experts say that this bill still isn't enough. Do you accept that criticism? There's been a ton of confusion from the CDC. Can we try to clear some of this up? Is America safer today with the Taliban in charge of Afghanistan? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Good morning. Welcome to Today. Start your day with us every morning. Get your daily dose of news on the go with the Today podcast. <laughs> and stream today anytime you want. Today, all day. Every day. Wherever you are, today is there. Our journey in the footsteps of Jesus takes us to the Negev Desert, from where the Bible says, Three kings came, wise men, following a star. Masar hai. Good to see you. Two millennia later, I go stargazing place. with amateur astronomers Wafa and Dawood. Great place to see the stars. They came on camels, records the Bible, from the east, bearing gifts. Traveling through the desert, yes. that would have been the best place for them to follow a star. Of course. They were the astronomers of their day. They were experts in astronomy. They were uh, using the science of astrology. Like all stories here, there are question marks. If a star just appears, we can't conclude that there was an earthquake, a birth or a death. That's just mythology. But according to the Bible, this is where the star guided the three kings to Bethlehem. And after 2,000 years, Main Street hasn't changed that much. This may be where the three wise men arrived in Bethlehem. Yes, actually this is one of the oldest streets at that time from where uh, the, the three wise men came to Bethlehem. It's now called? Star Street. Star Street. Star, the star, the sign of the wise men. <laughs> You can still buy some of those gifts that the three kings brought with them. And they sell all kinds of spices. Frankincense and myrrh. You have, you to, have burn to light it, it to yeah, burn right. it, yes. Right. Frankincense. Wow. Look at that. So expensive. Oh. This is a gift from kings. Yes. Yeah, for a new baby. Another and the gold. third gift? It's expensive, I don't have gold. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have any gold? No. <laughs> this is the very spot where it's believed the three kings came to. Called the Church of the Nativity, it was built some 1,700 years later, above what is thought to be that humble stable where Jesus was born. Think of his entrance. <laughs> you enter through this tiny doorway. But once inside, the detail is exquisite, is beautiful. From such humble beginnings, this incredible church and incredible story. Today's Bethlehem is beset by conflict. Located in the West Bank, flanked by a wall Israel built to section off the Palestinians who live here and prevent terror attacks. But raised every year in the heart of this holy city, the Christmas tree is a symbol with a different message. And at home, gathered around their own little tree, this Christian Palestinian family will also celebrate Christmas. Do you like Christmas? 
Yes. Why do you like it? We celebrate together and we have fun and we play games. The Christmas message is strong as ever. That little child who is born every year, he gives us hope. He gives us hope that a better future will be coming. Hope is the enduring promise of this holy land where competing stories have brought conflict for thousands of years. The flame of hope keeps burning. Stay connected and stream the news you need with Xfinity X5. Our top story is unfolding right now. The fast speed you depend on. We begin with breaking news right now in Florida. And a reliable connection for all your devices. This story matters to all of us. Whenever and however you watch. A bite-sized mix of everything you love, about all four hours of our show, but half the calories. Oh, yeah. oh yes. With Xfinity X5. Good morning. Welcome to Today. Start your day with us every morning. Get your daily dose of news on the go with the Today podcast. <laughs> and stream today anytime you want. Today, all day. Every day. Wherever you are, today is there. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So, it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Good morning, welcome to you today. Nice to have you with us. We wanted to surprise Ellie and make her wish come true. What do you think about coming to visit us? Yes. There's only one thing that people are saying. Like, you are <laughs> 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 Egypt, a country that goes back far into history, where the dead were more illustrious than the living, a society dedicated to the afterlife. Massive monuments celebrate its great kings and queens, their bodies mummified, and laid to rest for eternity inside colossal pyramids. All like in the Valley of the Kings, buried in hidden tombs beneath the desert. This is the tomb of Ramesses III. Ramesses was murdered in a plot masterminded by his wife, Queen Tia. The slain pharaoh was entombed here 3,000 years ago. But his mummy is not here. So where did it go? The answer to that question was buried at the top of this mountain. They're singing for you. I don't care. They're singing for me. Yes. Dr. Zahi Hawass is Egypt's leading archaeologist. He's taking me into a narrow shaft, 50 feet down, inside the mountain. to a sealed entrance. Okay, Kirk. Watch out for the snakes. Watch out for the snakes. Yeah. It's really claustrophobic. In these tunnels, 150 years ago, archaeologists made an astonishing discovery. They found mummy after mummy after a mummy, the greatest pharaohs who ruled Egypt in the time of the Golden Age. The mummies had been taken from their tombs and reburied here in antiquity to protect them from tomb raiders. Among the 50 royal mummies discovered here, they found Ramesses, and beside him, a strange and terrifying corpse. A screaming mummy. The screaming mummy. It sounds intriguing, 
but who was he? To answer that question, I travelled to Cairo and its famous Egyptian museum on the trail of a 3,000-year-old murder mystery. In a back room in the museum, I am shown the unmarked coffin found in the cave. The serene face carved on the lid is very different from the one inside. The screaming mummy had been executed, experts here think, for the murder of Ramesses. Look, you can see evidence of hanging his hair. They put him under the ropes. He could... <sighs> and stay like this. That's why the screaming mummy has opened mouth. Many of Egypt's royal mummies were embalmed here under the watchful eyes of the Sphinx in this temple. The mummification happening here. Yeah. It was a 70-day process. Pretty gruesome too. First step, empty the body of mummy from everything. All of the insides were out. Just only heart. Leave the heart. Leave heart. Brain empty from nose here. They emptied the brain yeah. from the mummy through yeah. the nose. Yeah. It's like a horror movie. Uh, it's happening really. Across Cairo, in this lab, using the latest scanning technology, radiologist Professor Sahar Salim has examined many of those royal mummies. This is the CT scan of uh, Ramses III showing the skull. They removed the brain and they placed large amount of uh, glue-like material called the resin. This is the, the perfect type of mummification, the royal quality mummification. But the screaming mummy, she says, is different, very different. This is uh, the screaming mummy skull. Unlike Ramses III and all the, the royals, the brain was not removed. It was left there. The remaining organs are left to desiccate and to dry. The screaming mummy was left to rot. Yes. <laughs> the body of the screaming mummy holds other secrets too. When scientists took DNA samples from the mummies found in the cave and compared them, they made an astonishing discovery. The screaming mummy was none other than the king's own son. His name was Pentaor, and his crime, plotting with his mother, Queen Tia, to kill his father and steal the throne. He was sentenced by the royal court. This is a court document. It is the court judgment that in this papyri, we can know how this boy, Pentaor, was in front of the court, and they asked him, to hang himself. His punishment, the worst of all ancient Egyptian curses, to deny him happiness in the afterlife. He was never properly mummified. This son who killed his father will go to hell. But what about his mother, the evil queen behind the murder plot? She is still missing. New and spectacular finds are being made here all the time. Recently, in the Valley of the Kings, archaeologists unearthed 20 elaborately decorated coffins of priests and high-ranking women. They were found just a few feet beneath the sand, where they had lain undisturbed for over 30 centuries. This, the moment so many around the world have been waiting for. Inside, a perfectly preserved mummy. Dr. Hawass was on hand to oversee the event. These are the best coffins I've ever seen for this period. His team has also discovered a lost city in the desert, the most important find since Tutankhamun, says Dr. Hawass. Now he is on the greatest quest of his career. Another mystery. Another tomb. Another tomb. Undiscovered. Undiscovered. A search for the tomb of Queen Nefertiti. She was the beautiful stepmother of Tutankhamun. It was my dream since I was a child to look for her. For Dr. Hawass, she is the ultimate prize. 
And he believes her tomb may be intact somewhere in this remote valley. It's a perfect place for the tomb of Refertiti to be hidden here. So he keeps digging, uncovering the mysteries of this ancient land. Secrets. You never know what the sand of Egypt may hide. With 85,000 square miles of desert to explore, that's a lot of places to hide those secrets. Welcome to Today All Day. Over the next 30 minutes, I'll be sharing some of my favorite interviews with you. These conversations include lessons from dads across the country, inspiring stories of hope, and a few laughs along the way as well. So sit tight, get ready for more. Today All Day, right now. For 10 years, James Michael Tyler played Gunther, the sarcastic manager of Central Perk, with an unrequited love for Jennifer Aniston's Rachel Green. Well, Gunther was a beloved character, which is why some were surprised he didn't have a more prominent role in that HBO Max reunion yeah. special. Well, it turns out Michael, as he is known, was not able to attend in person because privately he's been battling a very serious health issue. And this morning, for the first time, he's sharing his news with us. I'm sorry to say that I'm not appearing today with you to announce that there's going to be a Friends movie. Uh -huh. Actually, I'm here to let you know that in September of 2018, I was diagnosed with uh, advanced prostate cancer, which had spread to my bones. Here you go. For 10 seasons on the hit show Friends, James Michael Tyler played Gunther the sarcastic manager of Central Perk, Coffee House, and Hangout for the six main characters. Hey, Gunther, have you, uh, have you seen Chandler? I thought you were Chandler. <laughs> but, um, what if he's over there? When you were a part of that reunion a few weeks ago and you appeared via Zoom, what were you feeling in, in, in that moment? It was bittersweet, honestly. It was my decision not to um, be a part of that physically. Basically because I didn't want to bring a downer. You know, that was a celebration of 25 years. You know, I didn't want it to be like, oh, and by the way, Gunther has cancer. You know what I mean? Do the cast members know? Uh, yes, at this point, I'm sure. David Schwimmer has corresponded with me via Instagram. The producers are aware. They've been aware for a long time. Michael's prostate cancer was discovered during a routine physical almost three years ago when he was 56. His doctor had added a PSA test to his blood work, his first. The PSA, or prostate-specific antigen test, is the gold standard for screening for prostate cancer. It's recommended at 40 for African-American men and men with a family history of cancer, and age 45 for all others. It turns out I have prostate cancer. Good news is we caught it early. The uh, PSA test news. is also how our own Al Roker first discovered his prostate cancer diagnosis last November. A normal PSA number is around one. Michael's was 654. What's the prognosis? Well, for my uh, specific prognosis, it's, of course, a stage four, uh, late stage um, cancer, so Eventually, you know, it's gonna probably get me. Since his diagnosis, Michael had been treated with hormone therapy, which had him feeling well enough to visit us at the Today Show in 2019. Gunther is here, James, Michael, Tyler. When you were in the studio for the, for the reunion, how were you feeling then? I was feeling fine, honestly. I, I had no symptoms. During the pandemic, Michael's cancer mutated, causing fractures in his bones and tumors up and down his spine. He can no longer walk. What would you have done differently, Michael? Well, I would have listened to my wonderful wife, <laughs> who has been my absolute strength throughout all of this. I would have gone in earlier and, uh, you know, would have been hopefully caught earlier. Next time you go in for just a basic exam or your yearly checkup, please ask your doctor for a PSA test. Caught early, 99% treatable. 
Dr. Matthew Reddick, Michael's oncologist at UCLA, agrees early detection is key. With prostate cancer, it's a little bit different than the other cancers in that when it is diagnosed early, it's almost always cured. When it's diagnosed late, it's rarely, if ever, cured. Michael, you spent so many years making us smile and, and making us laugh, and that is always going to be part of your legacy. And now uh, you can add saving lives to that legacy as well. I certainly hope so, Craig. My goal this past year was to see my 59th birthday. I did that. My goal now is to help save at least one life. And he will. Mm -hmm. This morning, he, he will. Uh, we want to wish Michael the very best. He and his family will obviously be in our thoughts and prayers, and we encourage everyone to learn more about the prostate cancer screening recommendations from the Prostate Cancer Foundation. Michael's become very active with the Prostate Cancer Foundation, and you can find out uh, a little bit more about that foundation at today.com. And we are back with a heartwarming story mm -hmm. from Craig about the power of second chances. A judge lifting up a defendant instead of punishing him. Yes, you know, it, it all started when two men met 16 years ago as judge and the convicted drug dealer, and their connection grew into something much, much more. Mm. Edward Martell became Edward Martell Esquire recently. I, Edward Martell, do solemnly swear. Sworn into the Michigan bar by Judge Bruce Morrow. It is hereby ordered that Edward Francis Martell be and is hereby admitted to practice as an attorney and counselor at law. But it wasn't Martell's first appearance in front of Judge Morrow. That was 16 years ago. What was on that lengthy rap sheet of yours? You know, there was um, anything from possession of cocaine to delivery of crack cocaine and just a plethora of other, other violations. Ed Martell grew up in the Detroit area, the son of a single mother. As a teenager, he lost his way. By 15, I was selling drugs. By 16, 17, I was selling harder drugs and dropped out of school and left the home. At 27 years old, he was caught in a drug sting. What was the potential sentence then? So I was facing a one to 20 year sentence for actually for two counts. Would life have been different? The judge that sentenced him, Judge Morrow. Judge Morrow, what kind of judge are you? I am a hippie, 1960s, hardworking, believe in the best of people, loving on everybody I can type of judge. Judge Morrow's unconventional style, a source of controversy, as he currently stands accused of using graphic and inappropriate language in the court. But when it came to Martell, instead of sentencing him to prison time, the judge put him on probation and issued a challenge. He said, Mr. Martell, I challenge you, be a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. You don't have to be out here selling drugs. And I, and I believe you have greatness in you. And I accepted that challenge. You saw something in him. I saw a young man who was bright, intelligent, resilient, optimistic, and lost. <laughs> you know, it was, it was pretty simple. And, you know, I, I see my job as trying to provide opportunities for people that come in front of me to reintegrate them back into society and make them assist them in trying to be everything that they want to be. And what did Martell, a convicted felon, want to be? a lawyer, but the community college where he enrolled suggested something else, heating and cooling. They're trained to, if you have a criminal record, put, you know, suggest the heating and cooling. We went back and forth and eventually they agreed to let me take the prerequisites for the paralegal program. Martell graduated summa cum laude from the community college and ultimately got a scholarship to both the undergrad and law program at the University of Detroit Mercy. Throughout all of this, you're still staying in touch with someone. Who? Throughout this whole process, you know, Judge Morrow has been there. After I got off probation, I would just come in and hang out in his courtroom. And when I walk in, he'd just smile. We developed this father-son relationship. I never had a father growing up in the home, but if I imagine if, if I did it, you know, that this is what he would be like. So after Martell passed the Michigan bar exam and convinced the character and fitness board his days as a criminal were long gone, it only made sense that the judge who saw his potential and not his past would swear him in. 
Edward Francis Martel as a lawyer in the state. What did that moment mean to you? What did it feel like? It, it was full circle, just to reach the finish line and, you know, and then have him there to, to meet me and, and congratulate me and hug me and swear me in. You know, it's surreal. Judge, what was, what was that moment like, like for you? I was filled with, um, with joy for Ed because he did the hard work. All I had to do was support him and love him as much as I could, give him advice when he needed it, and just always just tell him I'm there and, and mean it and be there. Wow. Uh -huh. Nice. You know, <laughs> more than advice, the judge gave him a second chance. And to mark the occasion, by the way, Martel, he got a monogram briefcase from Perkins Law Firm, mm. and he's focusing on criminal law, not surprising. Uh, and he went on to say that he is living proof that love and opportunity equals success. Good morning, welcome to you today. Nice to have you with us. We wanted to surprise Ellie and make her wish come true. What do you think about coming to visit us? Yes. There's only one thing that people are saying. Like, you are <laughs> bad <laughs> For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Good morning, welcome to you today. Nice to have you with us. We wanted to surprise Ellie and make her wish come true. What do you think about coming to visit us? Yes. There's only one thing that people are saying. Like, you are <laughs> bad <laughs> Stay connected and stream the news you need with Xfinity XFi. Our top story is unfolding right now. The fast speed you depend on and a reliable connection for all your devices, whenever and however you watch with Xfinity XFi. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Well, Craig, George Floyd's death and some other high-profile cases have certainly led to a serious debate about the role of law enforcement. And you visited one of the nation's newest police academies where they're grappling with that. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, you know, Chanel, over the past few years, there have been uh, calls, including here in Minneapolis, of course, to defund police. Uh, there have been waves of early retirements by police officers. Stepping into this moment, nine students graduating today, by the way, and they're graduating from the police academy at Lincoln University. It's the first ever at a historically black college or university. Hands up! Don't shoot! As protests erupted across the country last year, Chief Gary uh, Hill for, was planning uh, to do something to make Union a difference. Soldiers, like I started a police academy for... He's the chief uh, of police at Lincoln University in Jefferson City, Missouri, an historically black college founded for black veterans of the Civil War. The first officer and I and this year Lincoln became the first HBCU to open its own police academy. How did this come to be? So I started calling the contacts that I've made over the last 20 years. People were like, that is a great idea. Why hasn't anyone thought about that? De-escalation as far as use of force. Now the nine students in the program are set to graduate today. And for the chief, it's a mission accomplished. What is it about this mission that was so compelling. When I went to the academy, um, there were 26 of us, and it may have been me and one other uh, black person in that academy. So it was, I felt like it was my mission to try to uh, change that. The latest research shows 67% of police officers in the United States are white, just over 12% are black. That closely mirrors the racial makeup of the general population, but Recent data shows that two-thirds of large police departments are whiter than the communities they police. Among the students at the police academy is Andre Jefferson. When you told friends and family that you wanted to go into law enforcement, were they supportive? Some, yes. Some, no. Because some are doing wrong, but you know, that's, that's the life they live. 
They're going to have to live their life. I'm going to have to live mine. The day we were there, the students put what they'd learned to the test. Chief Hill set up a mock road rage incident. The students didn't know what they were responding to. Do a speeding through the light. Hey, how y'all doing? I'm Officer Henderson. It He's becomes obvious pretty quickly that they're not in the classroom anymore. Hey, one at a time, sir. No, no, listen to me. Andre arrives as backup. Over here and talk to you. That's ridiculous. Together, they managed to separate the enraged drivers. Index, index, in the scenario, in the scenario. When it's over, the chief does not sugarcoat the criticism. And we get here and there's chaos going on. What should you have done? Separate. Separate. Did you do that? No, sir. But he also works to build up his students. Have faith and confidence in yourself, okay? Because when you get out there and you don't have faith and confidence in yourself, they will know that. You are sending these recruits into law enforcement at a time when you could make the argument that the relationship between the police and the policed has never been as complicated. What do you hope they accomplish, these recruits, when they start? I hope they accomplish, one, they get into the field and they stay into it. And I hope that they don't stop their education. Uh, and I hope that they set the example for other people that look like them. Uh, that is, that is, for me, that is a huge accomplishment. Hi guys, what's going on? Tiaja Fairley is next. She's from East St. Louis and says she'd never seen a black female officer growing up. So what's your name? She kept the fact that she'd entered a police academy a secret from family and friends until recently. During the exercise, she's able to de-escalate the situation. Can you stay right here? I'm going to talk to him. Yes. We talked to her afterward. I feel like it's just learning how to talk to people. Tiaja now dreams of becoming a homicide detective. You know, I feel like I could be a role model, kind of. Well, I hope to be a role model because I've never seen nothing like this. Calm both the parties down. What the chief sees is young people getting career training while helping their communities. For him, a dream come true. You tell him what you were going to do. If that's the future of the force, uh, we, are, we are in good shape, by the way. The chief says that they've already had 13 applicants for their next class at the police academy. And all of the students that we talked to who are graduating today at Lincoln, they all have jobs lined up. And the response beyond Lincoln has been uh, pretty incredible as well. Departments around the country have sent messages of support. Some of those departments have even donated gear to that program as well, guys. And Craig, as you showed earlier, you know, there are some white kids in that class, some black kids, and, and their discussion kind of informs how they're going to be police officers because mm -hmm. they get to see it from both sides. Yeah, and in fact, the chief told me how that the discussions that they have in class, those discussions are really the only thing that separates their training from traditional law enforcement training there in the state of Missouri. Uh, they've spent a fair amount of time over the past few months uh, talking about uh, what we've been watching unfold mm -hmm. in our country and hearing those different viewpoints in the class. Uh, the students told me that it's really shaped and molded how they view the world, mm -hmm. the kind That's of officers they're going to become. Really fascinating. Thanks. Craig, thanks for bringing us that. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Craig. Good morning. Welcome to you today. Nice to have you with us. We wanted to surprise Ellie and make her wish come true. What do you think about coming to visit us? Yes. There's only one thing that people are saying. Like, you are <laughs> bad. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Let's go. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. Some experts say that this bill still isn't enough. Do you accept that criticism? There's been a ton of confusion from the CDC. Can we try to clear some of this up? Is America safer today with the Taliban in charge of Afghanistan? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press.
And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Good morning, guys. You know, when you, when you talk about Ma Rainey's black bottom, hard not to focus on the performance of Chadwick Boseman because this was his last role before his untimely death at the age of 43. It, it's a performance that hit me pretty hard since I lost my brother last week to the same disease, colon cancer, also at the same age, 43. This conversation took place while I was traveling home last week for his services. I asked Bozeman, I asked how Bozeman's presence, rather, on the set affected the cast. I got talent. Oh, oh, me and this oh. horn, we tight. If my daddy had a note I was going to turn out like this, he would have named me Gabriel. Oh. It's a bittersweet moment when Chadwick Bozeman first appears on screen as an ambitious young musician in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Bozeman's stirring and moving performance is alongside Viola Davis, who plays the real-life mother of the blues, Ma Rainey. The film, set in Chicago in the 1920s, is an adaptation of the 1984 Broadway play of the same name, written by Pulitzer Prize winner August Wilson. Go get the boy a microphone. Directed by George C. Wolfe, the story focuses on a recording session with Ma Rainey and her jazz band. A group of talented musicians with complicated relationships, played by Coleman Domingo, Michael Potts, Glenn Turman, and Bozeman on the trumpet. Chadwick was playing all the time. No, he had not. the daggone horn in his in his hands at every moment. You know, it, when you heard cut, you'd still hear Chadwick. Yeah, man, <laughs> yep. yeah, man, yeah, man. yeah. You know. about them songs I give you. He grabs the audience by the collar immediately with his performance. Coleman, one of the most powerful scenes to me was that scene in which you and, and Chadwick Bozeman are, are going uh, back and forth about God and <clears throat> religion and betrayal and i understand that that was also a scene uh, that you found a fairly emotional well i won't give so much away but basically it is an argument about faith and about god's will and why do terrible things happen to good people and in that scene um i think there were some cracks and it touched us all dearly um glenn michael and i um chadwick we didn't know his struggle but I feel that there was something on the verge there and it broke through. Um, but it needed also these other three black men with him to help him with that. Knowing what we know now about what he was going through as he was portraying this character, how did he do it? When I tell you, not one person saw it. At all. At all. The man, the, the man, we all say he always demanded, George, can I get one more? Can I get one yeah. more? He always yeah. wanted to do another take, another take. He was a consummate professional. And he, he was having a good time. And that was yeah. the thing. I mean, you had all this superhuman strength, but you had someone who was truly enjoying the process of doing this and being here. It was incredibly important to him. The way that you managed to bring the stage play to life. George, what was it like bringing this one in particular to life? I know everybody says, but it was a joy because when you go into the room with smart people who are passionate, it's really special and magical. I have this little saying about collaboration, which is careful who you marry because that's who the child is going to look like. And in this <laughs> case, I married an endless parade of smart, brilliant people. Michael, the music in, in the film, uh, yeah. it rivals the acting. Did you learn how to play these instruments or? Yeah, we, yeah, we did. We, had, we didn't have a choice. <laughs> George would not tell us how well we needed to learn the instruments. He never. <laughs> and so we joke that we would hear each other rehearse and then get back to work. Because <laughs> we wanted to make sure we were not outdone. So that's probably why we became as proficient as we did. Many of the film's themes feel relevant today. The screenplay weaves racism, black identity, ambition, and how that intersects with the struggle to achieve the American dream. 
here's a film set in the 20s, but it, it felt like it felt like there were so many parallels uh, to the times in which we find ourselves right now, uh, specifically you know, the Black Lives Matter movement. That's attributed to August Wilson and his foresight as a playwright and a human being. All the questions that he asked, what are we going to do as a people, as a black people? Where is the black man today? Those are the nucleuses of our universe right now. I, uh, I so enjoyed my conversation with those guys. And it really is, objectively speaking, I mean, it's a, it's a phenomenal film, especially when you watch it, knowing, again, what we know about where Chadwick Boseman was uh, in his struggle with, with cancer. It really is phenomenal. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, yes, yes. Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh. Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Dancing on the stage is very exhilarating to show your expressions through movement. Sixteen-year-old Jimmy Long has been dancing competitively since he was six years old. But two years ago, his passion for dance was momentarily challenged by some teasing audience members during a performance at a local school. Some of the students were like saying derogatory comments and uh, some slurs. The comments thrown at Jimmy and the other male dancers were homophobic slurs. Jimmy's dad, Greg Long, drove Jimmy and his friends home after the incident and a new motto for their dance troupe was born. The phrase itself, dance on, how was that born? I got to listen to how uh, eight or nine uh, 12 year olds processed bigotry, uh, homophobia. Instead of getting uh, angry, I decided to make just a t-shirt for them. I came up with, hey, we're just gonna dance on. You know, we're just gonna move past this. Two years from those first t-shirts, Dance On, now a full-fledged nonprofit organization that has sold thousands of shirts and other Dance On apparel. All of the proceeds have gone directly to scholarships for financially at need dancers. You turn those homophobic slurs that were being hurled at your son uh, into quite a bit of good. It really was just saying, hey, you don't stop because somebody feels that you shouldn't be doing that. And even if it doesn't become your career, um, it, it does become your experience and, and it fuels everything in life. You ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready. Tell 2018, Greg's son Jimmy was invited to Chicago's United Center Arena to share the anti-bullying message of Dance On before former First Lady Michelle Obama took the stage for the launch of her Becoming Book Tour. I'm becoming an advocate for anti-bullying and I love to dance. When you were standing backstage, what, what was going through your mind? I, I lost it. I admittedly had tears coming down my face. The strength that it takes for somebody like that to stand in front of 20,000 people and say, I've been bullied and I'm not going to let it um, stop me from what I like to do. It's a proud moment. It's a proud moment. Sorry. Getting a little emotional. How could it not be a, uh, a proud moment? 
I definitely couldn't have done this without my dad. He helped me realize a lot of important lessons, like stay true to yourself. And he just is super supportive. Part of that support has been organizing master classes and events with professional male dancers who often share their own stories of being bullied. They've also helped the group by choreographing conceptual dance videos that amplify their message of acceptance and tolerance. It's been a very humbling experience for me, especially since I don't know the world that he lives in. So it's been nice to, to kind of um, be a part of that as opposed to just being the dad who claps very loudly in the back of the, the, of the auditorium. It's a testament to uh, how far father will go to help a child pursue his dreams. It, it's remarkable. Hi, today all day. We have a great show for you on this Tuesday morning. Let's kick it off with pop star Carson is back and he is covering all the busy headlines for us this morning. The Rock surprised a group of lucky tourists in Hollywood. Take a look. I haven't gotten a Carson Daily pop star in about a oh, month. Oh, you're missing wow. out. Heart. I mean, good oh, morning. It was a heck of a month. Good month. Come right? on. It was not. Come I on. Utter those words. I've been oh. seen it. Let's get God it. God bless you. Lots to get to today. This is great. This video I'm about to show you. Dwayne Johnson over the weekend, The Rock surprised a very lucky tour bus in his neighborhood. Have you seen this out? Oh, yeah. Filled with Hollywood sights here. It's one of those tour buses, and he drives by. Take a look. There's a tour bus here. There's always tours through my neighborhood. Hey, you guys know where I can find The Rock? <laughs> How you guys doing? Uh, I'll wait. I'll wait. Don't worry. <laughs> That's like one of the few presidents awesome. in Hollywood that could just pull up and you immediately, oh, yeah. immediately, it's like, oh, that's the rock. And he's such a good sport about it, too. No, he loves yeah. it. He wrote a yeah. caption for the Instagram post and it said, one of the cool parts of fame and my job making a few folks happy. And he definitely made their day, as you saw. All right, next up is Ed Sheeran. On Monday, the music superstar shared a sneak peek inside a recent recording session. Surprisingly, it, he wasn't there in the studio laying down tracks for his upcoming Equals album. Instead, Ed was in the studio recording harmonies for Taylor Swift's 2012 song, Everything has changed. Here's a listen. All I know is we said hello, and your eyes look like coming home. All I know is a simple name, and everything has changed. All I know is you held the door. You'll be mine, and I'll be yours. All I know since yesterday yeah, is everything has changed. Everything Has Changed comes from Swift's 2012 Red album, which she is preparing to re-release in November, along with a whole lineup of new songs and collaborations, I believe 30 songs in total. Sheeran slated to be featured on the track you just heard, and also another track called Run, which the two friends actually wrote together back when they first met. You can check it out when Red, Taylor's version, drops November 19th. And we are back with a geological wonder that has a history as rich as it is natural beauty. Yeah, we're talking about Mammoth Cave down in Kentucky. It's the longest cave system in the world. And then this is Gotti Schwartz is taking us inside. Hey, Gotti. Hey, good morning, guys. For thousands of years, humans have been descending into Mammoth Cave to marvel at its wonder. And a lot of the early exploration down here was done by slaves who are being honored today by a very special tour guide whose family history is literally written on the walls of this cave. Do you remember the first time you, you came through the entrance here? I remember uh, being about four or five years old, mom and dad would, would bring us down here to Mammoth Cave often. Jerry Bransford is 74 years old and Mammoth Cave is in his blood. This is everything that a cave named Mammoth ought to look like right here. My favorite room, the Rotunda. Created over millions of years by an underground river, Mammoth Cave is the world's longest cave system. Over 400 miles mapped and potentially another 600 miles unexplored. But to fully appreciate its grandeur, you have to know a little about its history and Jerry's. Everybody talking about Looks like there's excavation. Well, what, what you're seeing here is results of, of, of approximately 70 black men brought here to make gunpowder components for the War of 1812. Gunpowder used to help defeat the British and solidify America's independence. And that was for the fight for freedom that they didn't have. A fight for freedom that these poor men didn't have. After the War of 1812, the cave was purchased with designs on tourism. That's where Jerry comes in. How long has your family been connected to the cave? 
Uh, well, we began in 18 and 38, and we were here continuously till 1941. 1838 to 1940. Yes. Who was the first Bransford to work in the cave? Matt Madison, my great great grandfather. So you're you're five generations down. Right. Madison, as a 15 year old slave, was hired out to explore and map the cavern in 1838. He became one of the three original slave guides of Mammoth Cave. They learned the tricks of the trade quite quickly. They became entertainers, explorers, and guides. They had jobs that were unique mm -hmm. in America for people in slavery. On the surface, they were slaves, but when they would come down into the cave, they were guiding tours for world leaders. Absolutely. Once you got down in the cave, and you knew the cave better than anybody, uh, you were free. Molly Shower has been with the National Park Service for over 20 years. Her first job was as a guide for Mammoth Cave. So I've been to a lot of national parks, uh, none quite like this. <laughs> no, there's not. We, we always like to say we're two parks in one. We've got this beautiful surface area of the Green River Valley. But we also have uh, the longest cave in the world, Mammoth Cave. The cave is a geological wonder from the bottomless pit. Wow, that's hundreds of feet easily. It is. To the winding Ooh. way. <laughs> Where are we right now? We are in a very low area. So. Yeah. <laughs> this is known as Fat Man's Misery. It's getting pretty tight in here. All right. So that was Fat Man's Misery. This is Tall Man's Misery. It's a late workout. Woohoo! The cave is a labyrinth of tight passages, cavernous depths, and this, the River Styx. I see why they call it the River Styx. Yes, the, the <laughs> underworld. You're in the underworld under here. And in this kind of absolute darkness, you can't see your hands, but you can hear your thoughts. Are those voices? No. Just the sound of the water and probably your imagination. The cave is a natural wonder, and Jerry and his family's legacy are one of its most remarkable treasures. All around him, the name of his forefathers flicker on the walls, their history frozen in time by smoke and soot. So this is your great, great grandfather. It's my great, great grandfather. There's several places we can find his name far out and deep down. For over a hundred years, there was a Bransford working within the walls of this cave until 1941. That's when it was made into a national park and the land around the park was seized by eminent domain and black people were barred from being guides. Jerry's grandfather lost all he had. So your family went from being enslaved to exploring this cave, mm -hmm. to having land, having that land taken away by the government. Yes and then told that you guys couldn't work in the cave anymore. Right. For 66 years, the line of Bransford guides was broken until 2004, when Jerry found himself applying for the very job his ancestors had pioneered. When it comes to your family's legacy, what does this cave represent to you? Uh, the cave represents uh, an American story. It represents me walking in the footsteps of folks that were here way before me. 17 years later, Jerry is still walking the passages his ancestors helped map. I know I can't possibly think about staying here as many years I've been here already, but I don't feel like, I don't think I'm ready to go just yet. And while Jerry's name hasn't been etched into the walls and soot and smoke, he is now a part of this cave forever. They discovered a new passage and they named it the Jerry Bransford Way. In his honor, he says he plans on guiding here as long as he possibly can. Guys, oh, wow. God, he's That's a story, away. huh? Oh. God, he got wow. I hope he puts his name in the cave somewhere. I thought somewhere. about that too. Yeah. So his name is there and his grandfather's name yeah. is there. That's great. Coming up next on Today Talks on the third hour, it's Tune Up Tuesday, and we have some tips for you about ways to repair your skin. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Stay connected and stream the news you need with Xfinity X5. Our top story is unfolding right now. The fast speed you depend on. We begin with breaking news right now in Florida. And a reliable connection for all your devices. This story matters to all of us. Whenever and however you watch. A bite-sized mix of everything you love about all four hours of our show, but half the calories. Oh, oh yes. With Xfinity X5. 
make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Welcome back. Today on the third hour, we are still in the middle of summer, so we have some tips to repair our skin from the summer sun. Hey, this morning, tune up Tuesday for your skin. Uh, summer filled with sun, sand, water can all be damaging. Dr. Daniel Sugai is a board certified dermatologist and he's going to help us repair our skin today. And I should mention you can scan the QR code on your screen to see some of the products he's chosen. Good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Let's start with the first one. Full disclosure, I was just telling the guys during the commercial break that I've used this product now every morning. Um, so if you have overexposure to, let's say, chlorinated, salty, hard water, you say the solution in our, our for us is perhaps the facial cleanser, what you start your day with. Exactly. That's exactly right. So when uh, we arrange these products, I start from uh, starting for uh, my morning routine. These are all in order of what I would use in the morning and also what I would use in the evening. Okay. So you're right. The vanity cream cleanser is definitely important. Uh, step in starting off your skincare routine. This is a brand that I've been recommending since I was a dermatology resident at Harvard, and it is so gentle, great for sensitive skin, no fragrance, pH balanced, great at that balance clean where it removes impurities, sunscreen, makeup, but doesn't dry your skin out too much, especially after a long day at the pool or the beach. Hmm. Yeah, it works. And a lot of people double cleanse, you know, one with oil and one with water. Is that really I've necessary? Never double cleanse. A lot of people <laughs> double cleanse. Is that necessary? It's very popular, you're right, it's very popular. I usually say you can get away with a single cleanse, but if you have a thick layer of makeup, that's true. water resistant sunscreen, true. then you might need that double cleanse, like you said, the oil-based cleanser first, then water-based afterwards. Okay. All right. If you took all my makeup off right now, you would see like all over my forehead, dark spots, pigmentation. Oh no. I hide it well, right? Oh. Um, but vitamin C, you say, is something that could be used against that. That's exactly right. So in the skincare routine, I usually say start from thinnest to thickest. So you would cleanse, do a lightweight vitamin C serum, moisturizer cream, and then your sunscreen. And like you said, vitamin C serums are great for lightening those dark spots. And uh, this is Rocks Revive and Glow. I like this one a lot. Just so four to five drops to your face in the morning after your cleanser. It really helps fight free radical damage from the sun this summer or even the pollution. So with the wildfires going on, smoke pollution, all those things can accelerate the aging process. So this will help neutralize those free radicals in those exposures. It also has peptides and it has glycerin, which helps plump up the skin. So a very nice product to use in the morning. And Dr. Sugai, I love the fact that you're using it yourself. I know. Uh, you, you yourself, you're 73, you look yeah. fantastic. Uh, uh, moisturizer, you say, very important to use, uh, especially as we go from hot weather to cool. Right, and Al, I've grown up uh, watching you, so growing up watching you, so it's so great talking to you. But, oh, thank uh, you. So you're right. <laughs> so you're old, This Al. is great I'm, for I'm me. So. <laughs> I think we knew that. Anyway, tell so, us about the um, moisturizer. For sure. So this Kiehl's Ultra Facial Cream is really nice to layer over your serum, and it's just so cooling. I wish you guys could just feel it right now on your skin, and it's soothing, and it also has moisturizing ingredients like squalene, glycerin. Glycerin, uh, I mentioned before, in this product, it draws in water and it retains it and it plumps up your skin. So hmm. a nice bonus is that it can really hide those fine lines and wrinkles as well. I like how he's doing the 3D thing. I love yeah. it. <laughs> Keeping it. You can see what it looks like. I know. Let's try to, try to squeeze in sun, uh, sunscreen. For sure. Yep. That's my TikTok skills there with the in and out. So <laughs> I'm at Dr. SPF on TikTok and uh, I like to talk about sunscreen. I'm at Dr. SPF. So uh, sunscreen, as you guys know, it's very important to protect ourselves from UV radiation this summer that can lead to skin cancer or accelerate the aging process. Uh, a nice facial sunscreen is Coco Kind's Daily SPF 30. It is a zinc-based sunscreen, so it's mineral. But the tricky thing with mineral sunscreens is that it can cause a white cast. And yeah. Kind of scary. So this one does rub in very well. And it, if people who have oily skin, they say, oh, I don't want to put on a, a sunscreen. This one has rice starch, so it does uh, absorb excess oil, and it does have blue phytoplankton that will block also visible light from the sun. 
And here I have Blue Lizard's uh, Australian sunscreen for the body. So face, body, go for SPF 30 or 50. I always tell my patients you can do SPF 30 and above, reapply every one to two hours. The neat thing about this is that it is mineral base, it rubs in well, but the cap will change color in the sun. So when uh, it turns blue, the cap is telling you, hey, there's harmful UV rays present. Oh. Apply your sunscreen. I like that. You're our Looks dermatologist like it rubs in our model. Too. Like he's got two in one there. <laughs> Dr. Daniel Sugai, thank you so much. And by the way, Dr. Daniel has one more bonus item on his list. Just head to today.com slash shop to check it out. Just so you know, today gets paid a commission for purchases made through the QR codes or links on the site. Coming up on Hoda and Jenna, it's a show all about health and beauty. Some experts say that this bill still isn't enough. Do you accept that criticism? There's been a ton of confusion from the CDC. Can we try to clear some of this up? Is America safer today with the Taliban in charge of Afghanistan? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Make the most of your day with... Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Let's go. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you what you must know. The biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. Today on Hoda and Jenna, the ladies give you some tips to be your best self. They even talk to a sleep expert about the best ways to get a good night's sleep. Check it out. Okay, since this is our health and beauty show, we thought we would share a couple of things. I do love we'll be we dedicated an hour to yes. something because sometimes don't you just wish you're like, let me just focus. I want to rewrite the ship because it's already the end of August. People are thinking about school. Yes. And, you know, don't getting you think a restart. It's that time of year. Like yeah. I remember being at the end of summer as a little kid, and I would look at the YM magazine, the oh, Young yeah, Miss yeah, magazine, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I would circle, I mean, like I, I never did anything with it, but I'd circle outfits, outfits that I thought were cute, or I'd circle things. It's like, September's a good time to yes, refresh. Yes. And just like books and movies and television shows, I feel like beauty products, we want recommendations. Yes, beauty and health. I and think health. those are two really health. important things. I'll start okay. with, I guess, more beauty. Yeah, let's see. Okay, this stuff is called bio oil, and it you really get it for scars or, you know, I used it when I was pregnant, stretch marks or whatever, okay. but I'm telling you, what is it? the I? secret, what? in my opinion, what is that it's great, sorry that that's so okay, too much, like it. it's great to use it as a lotion <gasps> because Oh, it smells it smell awesome. Great. And I think right when you get out of the shower. Oh, that's a lot of. Well, I know you look good. shiny. But, <laughs> but right when you get out of the shower, it moisturizes. And I think <gasps> oil is a little easier Wait, to put it on than again? lotion. Bio? Bio oil. Where do you get it? Uh, you get it at Target or Walmart, Walmart or, or Amazon.com. And just uneven skin. Uneven skin. Do you put it on your face or is it body I, for body? I just use it in the body. Okay. But anyway, I love this for face quickly, and I don't know why Gosh, this is the world's the way, smallest it smells so good. sunscreen, but what try is that? this. This is sunscreen called <gasps> from Google. Where is it? It's so That's clear. It. And I use it on my kids too. It's Wait. called the Unseen Sunscreen by Super Goop, and it's totally <gasps> invisible. Has no scent. Wow. Don't you think that's great? Yes, it's by Supergoop. Supergoop. Okay. okay. All right. What 
It's a lot of gook. I'm sorry, I got gook all over. I'm okay. like covered. Um, so mine is, I just feel like when I think of health and beauty, I always think about like how to start the day yes. so that you feel good. Because if the day, the beginning of the day is off, yeah. it's all crummy. So each morning I started making this special tea that I've made for you. It's and so good. it's simple to make, it's easy as pie, but it's so good. So I always get up first thing. I open my eyes, I get a bottle of water, and I drink it down, the whole I've, thing. You taught me that. And by the way, I have to tell you, if you were to ask me a couple of questions before I had the water and after, yes. I feel like you have clarity, like your body hasn't had anything it in its system. It gets your system going. Right, before the coffee or before the tea. Yes. Then after that cup, I, I make a tea. So. I buy these frozen ginger cubes. They sell them at Trader Joe's or whatever. Okay. Those are them, those okay. little things. And if you flip it over, which I didn't, they have a little square. So you just drop one in, you get a, gi a ginger lemon tea, and then you get a part of a lemon and just squeeze it in there. And then just mix, mix, mix. And then take honey and whoosh, squirt it in there, mix it up. And it's like a cleansing. Sometimes I do it without the honey, which is kind of yucky. No, but it I does ginger, cleanse. Though. It's gin, yeah, it's ginger and lemon. And then after that cup, then I have coffee. But it's a lot of hydrating. But it yes. feels really, really good. And then I do our calming breaths that we do. And then and you write in your journal. I write my journal. And then I feel like, okay, that was. And how much time did that take? While the water's boiling, I was listening to something inspirational. Yeah. So I'm, I feel like, so while that's going, I'm, they, they have this, like there's a hundred prayers in this one book. So, and they talk about grace and whatever. So I listen while it's boiling. When it's done boiling, I take my things out. I drink it. I think, like, I feel like all you need is, and that's all in 10 minutes. It's I am not starting like, my, I'm changing my morning routine. <laughs> okay, speaking of trends, an unusual yeah. health trend that just popped up this year. It's called eye yoga. And evidently Paul McCartney is a huge fan. He okay. does exercises with his eyeballs. Apparently, he says that it leads to good vision. He learned this from a yogi years ago. And even in his 70s, y'all, he don't wear glasses. He doesn't need glasses. I want to know what his parents, how their vision well, was years ago. I know, but i just like to know. Anyway, so here's how he does it. Okay. So you're supposed to sit with your head perfectly still, like looking straight ahead. Okay. And then look as far up as you, as you can and count for the count of three. One. Two, three. And then look all the way down. Down. Out. One, two, <laughs> three. And then sideways. Uh, it's hard uh, to do it without moving two, your cheeks. Three. You got to see just right. We're telling you your, your head is pressing. Why is my mouth other, opening? I don't know. <laughs> you're <laughs> putting on mascara. <laughs> okay. Anyway. All right. So today.com did speak to an eye doctor who says it can't hurt and benefits of doing eye yoga are likely, but. Strangely, nobody has ever studied this before. Uh, it's very odd. I think it's interesting. I think we though. should study eye yoga. Yeah. All anyway, right. all right. So, if you want better health, any doctor will agree that a good night's sleep is essential, and often that's hard to come by, yes. no matter what profession you're in. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. So we talked to an expert about how to maximize your sleep, and how. But first, we asked four of our staffers to share their last 60 minutes before bed oh. to see if their nighttime routines could use improvement. I think they probably do. Take a look. Okay, it's about 6.30, just about an hour before bedtime for my two kids, Alex and Julia. Around this time, we're wrapping up dinner and Alex is doing his homework. He's practicing reading. I'm sitting on the couch. My roommates are hanging out. I'm having a little dessert. It's 7.30 now, time to get these two kids in bed. They're in their pajamas and we usually like to end the day with the story. What's your favorite book to read before bed? Five-minute princess story. Who is that? Tommy Train. Ooh, Thomas the Train. Good choice. Okay, so it's 8 o'clock, and I'm going to make some tea. I usually take a fish oil and a magnesium. It's probably an hour before we get into bed, and I hate to say it. We're just eating. Oh, it's takeout night, though, so yum. It's an hour before my bedtime, and I'll dim the lights a little bit watch some TV for about 45 minutes. And this is around the time that I usually look over everything for the next day's show. And then I head to bed myself because it's an early wake up call. I'm checking some emails, last minute emails. We're thinking about stuff that we didn't do, so we start doing them. It's almost bedtime. I'm laying down now. I have my eye mask in, on and my earplugs. I have the bright TV on and I'm also watching TikToks at the same time. Good night, Ken. 
Nighty night. Good night, cutie patootie, Paula and Jenna. Stay connected and stream the news you need with Xfinity X5. Our top story is unfolding right now. The fast speed you depend on. We begin with breaking news right now in Florida. And a reliable connection for all your devices. This story matters to all of us. Whenever and however you watch. A bite-sized mix of everything you love about all four hours of our show, but half the calories. Oh, oh yes. With Xfinity X5. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Good morning. Welcome to you today. Nice to have you with us. We wanted to surprise Ellie and make her wish come true. What do you think about coming to visit us? Yes. There's only one thing that people are saying. Like, you are <laughs> bad. Stay connected and stream the news you need with Xfinity X5. Our top story is unfolding right now. The fast speed you depend on and a reliable connection for all your devices whenever and however you watch with Xfinity X5. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Some of our staffers showed you their bedtime routine, but are they doing the right things for a good night's sleep? We asked Dr. Rebecca Robbins that very question. She's a scientist at Brigham and Women's Hospital and has some advice for our staffers and really for all of us, all of you, check it out. Rebecca, welcome, welcome. It's good to see you. Good morning. It's great to see you both, too. Okay. Thank you for having me. We're course. happy to have you. Let's, talk, let's start with Lana. Okay, so Lana seemed like she did it great. She put her kids to bed, and then she started doing her homework because she had like her own she to has do. to work. That's she the, has to work. So what, what could she have improved upon? Well, a couple things I love about this bedtime routine are first and foremost, the consistency. Yeah. She has a time that she knows she's starting to get the kids ready for bed and bedtime routines and consistent routines are crucial for all of us, but particularly our children. And before bedtime, we really want to pack those 60 minutes with things that are soothing and relaxing to us. So that I think is absolutely fantastic. Okay, now, is there a set time kids should be getting to bed? Yeah. I mean, different age kids, but let's say, you know, school age children in elementary school, how many hours of sleep a night should they be getting? By and large, children need as much sleep as they can get. More sleep helps, uh, um, supports their healthy development and a host of other positive outcomes. And one of the biggest gifts that we can give our children is keeping bedtimes consistent yeah. for children and parents. Consistency is really key because then our brains and our bodies start to understand when they're supposed to be tired and when we're supposed to be alert. We'll fall asleep faster if we keep our consistent uh, our, our okay. routines consistent. Mm -hmm. All right, poor Sydney. Sid. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so Sydney <laughs> has got her eye mask on as she was going to bed, putting her earplugs but in. But she also hung with friends, which, well, we love that, but she also had TikTok videos she okay, confessed to. Okay, I think there's good and bad. Tell All us. Right. There's good and bad here. So let's start with the good. Now, having dessert and, and finishing eating uh, about three or four hours, it sounds like, before her bedtime is perfect. That's great mm -hmm. for all of us to think about it, um, kind of starting to finish um, being done with eating around that time. She's mm -hmm. also socializing and chatting with friends. Friends, and that's fabulous, whether it's yeah. our family members, our spouse, our loved ones. You really want to think about happy memories here, really kind of stepping away from the day and, and really filling the evening with positive energy. Now, okay. things that could be improved with yeah. her routine are the following. The use of uh, bright television and uh, at <laughs> the same time, TikTok is something that we could probably improve. And there are two things going on here. The first is the bright light of the television. Mm -hmm. And what's that, what that is doing is actually giving our brains a physiological cue like the sun. We go outside in the morning and we're energized. That bright light from the television is actually giving our brains a cue to become awake. Right. So um, perhaps you could think about doing some te the television watching a little bit earlier in the day. Now, the other aspect of her routine uh, that could be improved when she's really close to bedtime is using social media and specifically TikTok because there are mm -hmm. so many beautiful uh, videos and, and images on those platforms that it's activating all the wrong parts of the brain and, when we're trying to be powering down uh, exactly yeah. those parts. Um, you know, we want to run so through. So thinking about the soothing things that she could do, sure. maybe some 
uh, you know, it, meditation or imagery or um, or slipping into sleep. Rebecca, and yeah, let, we, we just things. have a couple of seconds left. Mm -hmm. We wanted to to get through the rest. Yeah, so, so Channing, yes or no? Yeah, Channing, she drinks yeah. tea, which I think is probably good. Good. Tea is a great thing to do before bedtime, uh, especially if you're you have a little bit of a sweet tooth and you're inclined to maybe reach for some sweets too close to bedtime. Having a tea instead is a great substitute. Okay. Okay. What about Rena? We love her. Some, a lot of people feel this way. They have to work. They realize that their you, day isn't over. Late. Yeah. So she ate we late, but then she hours. was. Yeah. yeah. So she had to eat at some point, and then she's also mm. in in bed working. Thoughts on that? Two things here going on. So when we eat dinner too close to bedtime, within that hour, um, we're really starting to, the body's going to be digesting. And we're going to try to be powering down. So having dinner as early in the night as possible is one thing you could improve on. Now, the second piece is emailing from bed. We really want to keep our beds a, a special place. It's where we sleep. It's where we relax mm -hmm. and get all of our technology out of the bed and out of the bedroom, ideally. All right. Okay. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate it, Rebecca. All right, we needed that, yeah. some good advice there. And for more tips on how to get a better night's sleep, you can go to today.com slash sleep. First of all, thank you so much for, for talking with us, Jessica and Beth. But I want to hear about the first time, Jessica, you swam and what it felt like, what it meant to you. Um, take us back to that day. Yeah, absolutely. So the first time I really remember was joining a swim team when I was 10 years old. I think that for me was really the moment I just fell in love with this idea of becoming a swimmer. And I showed up to the pool. I'm the only girl missing her legs. I am very aware of that. And I sit down in a chair and I take off my two heavy little prosthetic legs and I crawl on my knees to the edge of the pool and I just jumped in and I, I just instantly loved it. I think for me, the water has always been a place of freedom, safety, but also feeling really strong and capable, even though I am missing my legs. And, and Beth, what about as her mom watching her find this place, like as she just said, that made her feel free? Yes. What did that feel like to watch as her as her parent? It was very exciting. I mean, we had seen her swim in her grandparents' pool when we went on vacation. So she always loved the water from when she was very little. But then when she found this team, she really learned a lot of the sport. She learned all the different strokes and she liked having a coach and she's always been very athletic. So she was doing gymnastics, but finding something that was, wouldn't damage her knees and that was safer for her. And then she felt so free in the water. She just really took to it. She loved it. And of course, you know, she always says she felt like a mermaid. And um, so we were happy for her. I So I can't help but think you joined a team, like, you know, any old swim team, really, when you were 10. And then by 12, you were in the Paralympic Games. I mean, two years later. So there must have been this moment where you were like, okay, this is more than just a hobby. <laughs> well, I really like to win. And I really like <laughs> to be competitive. And I think for me, though, being the, the swimmer on the team without her legs, I had to work extra hard, right? I had to always show up and give 110% because if I didn't, I wouldn't make it through these these practices. And I, I really loved going to this the swim team just because, you know, I grew up, I was homeschooled. I'm one of six kids, but I always love the social aspect and the competitiveness of others, like competing with other kids. So when I showed up and I, I knew two strokes at the time, I could not even do butterfly or breaststroke. That took about a year to learn. I, I did work really hard on my technique just because not having a kick, I really relied on my core, my upper body strength. So to make the team when I was 12 shocked everyone. I think it even shocked myself a little bit, but also at the same time, like I just kept selling, telling myself I was going to make the 2004 Paralympic team. And somehow I did. Um, I was a freestyler only at that time. Now I do all four strokes, but I just had this just such determination to just prove to everyone that I could do it. And I think that even stems from my adoption, just wanting to prove that I was worthy, that I was enough. And I found a place that I felt like I could do that in, and I excelled in swimming. 23 medals later, you're going back to your fifth games. Do you still get that kind of excitement, you know, that kind of pinch me moment feeling when you're competing? 
I do. That's what I live for. I really live for the racing, the moments in those races where it just everything slows down, even though you're swimming as fast as possible. I that's what I train for. You know, I'm right now living out at the Olympic and Paralympic Training Center here in Colorado. And I moved out here a year ago. Um, I left my my newlywed husband um, to come out here and train and just really try, you know, just to sacrifice um, just to see what I'm still capable of. You know, I'm 29. I'm definitely a veteran. My shoulders hurt a little bit more than they did when I was 20, 16, but I just, I still have a love for it. And I think as long as I'm still learning and enjoying it, um, I think it's still worth it to continue. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Stay connected and stream the news you need with Xfinity X5. Our top story is unfolding right now. The fast speed you depend on. We begin with breaking news right now in Florida. And a reliable connection for all your devices. This story matters to all of us. Whenever and however you watch. A bite-sized mix of everything you love, about all four hours of our show, but half the calories. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. With Xfinity X5. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, oh. Shop today with Joe Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Mrs. Long? Yes? We've found a baby girl for your adoption, but there are some things you need to know. She's in Siberia, and she was born with a rare condition. Her legs will need to be amputated. I know this is difficult to hear. Her life, it won't be easy. Mrs. Long? It might not be easy, but it'll be amazing. I can't wait to meet her. I was watching the Super Bowl and your commercial, I was like bawling, crying, holding my baby in my arms. Like, this is beautiful. <laughs> what was that experience like for you? Because this is your story. It was so beautifully t told, but you've lived it. You know, what was it like to see that, that come to life? Um, it was a, just a very special moment, um, especially for Jessica. Like it was such a, like a culmination of so many things that she had done and all of her successes, like on this one commercial. And then it brought her family and our love for her and her love for us. And it just all came together. So we're so thankful to Toyota for, for that commercial mm -hmm. and for those moments that she's given not only us and our family, but so many different families out there. And, you know, so it's, it's been really special, very special. Mm -hmm. Jessica, what was it like for you? Oh gosh, I always get really emotional when I talk about it. <laughs> so here, and my eyes are already watering. Um, <laughs> it was really healing. I would say it was incredibly healing, but also at the same time, it was so nerve wracking, right? I've lived my life. I know the pain, the sacrifices, the surgeries, all of the moments that people don't get to see, right? People see the success and they see the medals and they see the awards. But that really captured just kind of the whole thing, right? Being adopted from an orphanage, right? Being put up by a 16-year-old girl and being adopted into an incredible family. Um, but adoption still, like, it was hard. You know, there were moments where there were, there were no answers, right, as to why was I given up and was it my legs? And my parents, Steve and Beth, they did an incredible job just always answering those questions because I think I asked like 10 times a day. And it was just hard to comprehend, I think. You know, my, my little sister, Hannah, who was the miracle baby who came after my parents adopted my brother and I um, in Russia and it, 
just in the same orphanage, um, she had legs, right? So there was a lot of questions, a lot of confusion. So it was so beautifully done, even just the locker room scenes, getting to see it come together. I was a part of all of it, but I would say definitely the last scene. Um, we only shot that maybe two or three times just because we captured it. But I really, I swam up to that, that part in the, the last scene and I got to look at um, the two people who played uh, my parents and they picked actors who looked like my parents back then. And I just tried to put myself in that, in that position, like that spot, right? Like how they got the phone call because growing up my whole life, I thought of, oh, I was given up for adoption. But seeing that excitement on my parents' face, like we get her, we get this little baby from Siberia. It was just like, this is so cool. I never even thought of it like this. So when I smile and I push off, um, that was all very real. And we only shot it a few times. Mm. It was so beautiful. Good morning. Welcome to Today. Start your day with us every morning. Get your daily dose of news on the go with the Today podcast. <laughs> Boom. And stream today anytime you want. Today, all day. Every day. Wherever you are, today is there. Let's go. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. And good evening from New Orleans, there is breaking news. Good morning, welcome to you today. Nice to have you with us. We wanted to surprise Ellie and make her wish come true. What do you think about coming to visit us? Yes. There's only one thing that people are saying. Like, you are <laughs> bad <laughs> And good evening from New Orleans, there is breaking news. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Where does your, your grit come from? We saw the beautiful commercial, but we didn't get to see some of the pain, um, the, the surgeries. Um, talk, about what, talk about what it was like as a little girl. Yeah, it was so hard, like so incredibly hard. You know, I think when I look back on my childhood, there's memories that I don't remember just because there was so much pain, right? And I think swimming was truly a way that I just felt that that freedom from all of those surgeries and the pain, but it was hard, right? My, my little legs, I had a foot with three toes on each leg. Um, I was born with fibular hemimelia. Um, those little feet with three toes were amputated when I was 18 months old. And I was up walking around within a couple of weeks and these little prosthetic legs. And I think for me, it was never just one, one and done, right? I never just had to overcome once. It was every time I grew due to the bone um, growing, I had to go back in for a surgery. And I remember just being really, really scared, but also under, like knowing exactly what to do. Like as a three-year-old, I knew to crawl on top of the operating table and it was cold. And I still remember the smells and um, they were so sweet. They always let me bring in a parent um, into the operating room. And I would always fall asleep and wake up in a lot of pain. Um, there was draining tubes. But, you know, and after those surgeries, you know, I had to learn how to rewalk all over again. You know, it was an entire process. And I've had dozens of surgeries on each leg. And if we got the right leg done, it was the left. I think my determination always came from just it wasn't an option to quit. Because if I had quit, if I had given up in those moments, I really don't know where I would have been. I knew I had to get through it. I knew I didn't fully understand why, right? I think that's something I've really worked on is, is finding my why. But at the time when you're six years old, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, going back in for surgery, 
I just, I had no choice but to, to press on. And I will say this is so cute. And mom, you can correct me, but I always requested Pippi Longstocking, the movie. And she was the girl who believed she could do anything. And I, they knew to have it ready for me in my recovery room. They always had Pippi Longstocking for me to watch. The fact that, that you were doing these things that were just unbelievable, um, suffering pain that no parent wants to see their child suffer from. That's what was it like for you all? Um, it was difficult. I mean, we, we, had planned for surgeries and we knew that that would happen but going through it of course is harder than you think and so the very first surgery with the amputation all we expected so we were ready we felt very prepared it was still difficult and um the little feet that she had like it was really hard for her to lose those like mm -hmm. you don't realize like once she comes you love every part of her so it's mm -hmm. actually losing a, a piece of her and so that was more difficult than I thought it would be. But then after that, all of the other surgeries weren't expected. So they just, she kept having bony overgrowth more than most children did. She kept having things happen that she would need surgeries. So we just, I mean, just like she did, we just had to get through it. So we prayed and we cried and we held her hand and we slept in hospital rooms and we just did it. So it was difficult, but it also drew us very close together. And Jessica, I know you love being part of this big family, lots of siblings. <laughs> what was what was that like? Yeah, I truly feel like I won the jackpot. I I loved it. I look back on my childhood and I just think how just incredible and special it was. We were that crazy family of six, big van, homeschooled family, but it was so, so beautiful. And we just had just space and time to grow up slowly. And I think that was really special. That was one thing my parents always wanted was just for us to, to just be really close. And, you know, I had an amazing big sister, a big brother, my brother, Josh, who was adopted from the same orphanage. And then it was really wild when Hannah came because Hannah was the miracle baby and she came on their anniversary. And I just remember thinking, who is this little thing? <laughs> And I wasn't sure about her, but now, I mean, she's my best friend. I love her. And then Gracie came and, you know, I have four sisters. I have two brothers. I just, it's, it's so fun and chaotic and crazy. And it, it's been, it's the best, you know, it, it's funny. I don't actually look like everyone, but I have so many of the same mannerisms and um, I truly feel like it was exactly where I was meant to be. And um, it's, yeah, it's the best thing. I know. Do you ever think, and I'm sure you have, about what would have happened if your mom and dad hadn't taken that call? Yeah, it, it would have been really bad. You know, I, I think that's one thing I, I really have a passion and a heart for as I've gotten older is, you know, I really want to to help orphans and, and get more into adoption. My husband and I, we've talked about adoption and and it's been a slow process. You know, I've been in you know therapy to talk about adoption and some of the pain and and not, you know, just, just pain as in, you know, questions that will probably never be answered. You know, even though I met my birth mom um, about in 2014, I went back and met my birth mom and she married my birth father and they mm. have three children after me. Um, there's still a lot of questions that just were never really answered, you know, just translation and stuff. But um, my life would have been just very different, you know, and that's really hard to see because sometimes you know, sometimes my heart aches for what could have been, but also it's like, I love exactly where I am. And it's really hard to feel just kind of, you got to stay in that middle area, just being thankful that I'm along, but also understanding where my roots came from and that maybe that Russian determination. And, you know, it was incredibly special to meet my, my birth mom. That was really hard. Um, probably the hardest thing I've ever done. And also to know that I look like her and it's just wild. Right. And I think even going back to the Super Bowl, just you know, people got to see that, that my life, but I don't know how many people know that I got to go back and meet my birth mom, no. my birth father and three children or three siblings. But it's a lot. And what was that? What was that like? I mean, what was that moment when you first saw them? <laughs> well, <laughs> when I first touched down in Russia, I brought my little sister, Hannah, and this was 2014. So I think I was 20, 21, 22. So I'm pretty young. And you know, I found out about them competing in the 2012 Paralympics. I found out while I was competing, and that was mm. very hard. But, you know, I, I had known my whole life about my birth mom. I knew her name was Natalia. I knew that she had named me Tatiana. Um, but when we touched down in Russia after, like, traveling for, like, days, it felt like, all of a sudden, it was in that moment where I was like, maybe she doesn't want to see me. Like, maybe, mm. like, what am I doing? And... Hannah and I unpacked and sh I showered and I went right up and started like on the elliptical. And I think I was on the elliptical for three hours with my sister just sitting in a chair by me. 
and just I had to really process and, and kind of get get like process the idea that I was going to go to the orphanage I was adopted to which I was the only person to ever go back to that orphanage mm -hmm. and I met the woman who had like physically handed me over to my dad I got to meet her and she just kept hugging me and calling me Tanya and then the morning came when I got to meet my birth mom and I, I called my family, I called my mom and my dad and, and siblings in Baltimore. And I didn't even want to talk about what I was doing, but I was just like, tell me about, about you guys. I think we were doing our class. They were doing their like classic, like movie night. And I was just like, how are you guys? Even though we're all the way in Russia. And then we pulled up to this tiny little purple house in like the middle of nowhere. Like it took us three hours to get there in the middle of like the woods with snow everywhere. And I got out and I think that was truly one of the bravest things I've ever done. Um, even when I look back on the surgeries and the competing and everything, um, just getting out of that car and going to meet her. But I got out and I walked down and you could hear them crying in the house. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to cry. And at that point I was not into crying. Now I'm like, oh. um, so she came out of the back porch and I was like, don't slip. Like I'm just talking to myself and don't slip. And um, when she hugged me, there was just this moment I think of release of just freedom of just forgiving her. Um, just, you know, my whole life I was angry at her. Anger really fueled me that I just allowed myself to let her hug me because I think she needed that. I don't think she had forgiven herself. And I just remember saying like, this is my mom, like my birth mom. Like This is wild. Like not a lot of people get to do that or meet them. And especially for it to be such a good outcome. And I got to show her my legs and talk to her. And, and it was just so incredibly special. I can't even imagine. And that does take a, a amount of courage and bravery because there must have been part of you that felt, you know, abandoned. But at the same time, imagine, I'm sure you can't even imagine what your life would be without your family, without your mom and your dad and they, your sisters and brothers. And, and, you know, the fact that they heard, okay, she's going to need all these surgeries, but no, no, she's our baby. We knew that before we met her. I think it's funny. I swear I'm like, I love them more than my other siblings. Like just, I mean, I'm the one that calls my mother like 18 times a day, but I'm like, I mean, you guys saved me in a way. Not like I needed saving, but my life would have been really, really bad in Russia. We don't know. You know, I probably would have been crawling around in orphanages and living on the floor. And that's the reality, right? You never know. Um, would have been kicked out at 18 if I had made it to 18. And there's a lot. I think people really need to look into that you know, what's happening in these orphanages. Mm -hmm. um, so my life would have been really different. And even though it's hard, right, I struggled being adopted because it's like you still struggle with abandonment. And I knew she loved me, my birth mom. You know, she took the time to name me. There was a lot there, but it's like, I swear I love my, I'm like, I love you two more than anything. As I don't know, as crazy as the family is, but I'm like, I, I just call them all the time. And maybe just because I have this extra, extra appreciation that they went to, Russia I don't know why but I went to Russia my dad went to Russia um and I just think it's really really sweet one of my favorite things I think my dad has ever just said like just how hard it was when he was in the orphanage because my mom stayed back with the two kids the older two um just how hard it was for him when he showed up to the orphanage and saw me for the first time like it was a two-week process to get all the paperwork and everything just how hard to leave us like to leave us was because he was like you were my kids and I just think it really does take such incredible and special people to to want to adopt kids like like they did. Yeah. You know, um, Hoda and my mom actually both say this. They say that everybody gets their babies right on time. Whoever's <laughs> meant to be their babies. It happens when it's supposed to. Beth, is that something you saw happen in your life? Yes, um, definitely. I know um, we had two children and then we could not have more children or so we thought and then we, um you know we got to jessica and joshua and we felt like that was definitely meant to be we feel like it was a god thing um you know and then he opened my womb later and i had a couple more children but for some reason you know we did not have children for eight years and in that time we had such a desire for more children and as we prayed we figured out that we really wanted children that would maybe not be adopted children that really um needed a home you know we already had a couple of babies so we didn't need a baby um but we wanted children that really need to be adopted so we feel like god was of course in all of that and we know that jessica and joshua were the children for us and yes definitely the timing was exactly right
Stay connected and stream the news you need with Xfinity X5. Our top story is unfolding right now. The fast speed you depend on and a reliable connection for all your devices, whenever and however you watch with Xfinity X5. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you what you must know. The biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. Some experts say that this bill still isn't enough. Do you accept that criticism? There's been a ton of confusion from the CDC. Can we try to clear some of this up? Is America safer today with the Taliban in charge of Afghanistan? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Some experts say that this bill still isn't enough. Do you accept that criticism? There's been a ton of confusion from the CDC. Can we try to clear some of this up? Is America safer today with the Taliban in charge of Afghanistan? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Just what do you think your four or five-year-old self would think about the fact that you're headed to your fifth games, 23 medals later, that like this is your story? It's wild, right? It's been a very emotional, tough couple weeks leading into Tokyo. Um, so this is like the first time I'm really sitting down, just kind of talking about all the, you know, everything. Um, but just processing just how, ex how proud, you know, how proud she would be. And I think that's kind of my thought process going into this. Um, you know, I've definitely made the sacrifice of coming out here and training in Colorado and away from my family. I'm very family oriented. I love you know, all of that. So it's been really hard. And especially having an extra year, everyone knows that, right? We've all gone through a really yeah. challenging year. Um, but I just think when it gets tough, because there's going to be tough moments in Tokyo, right? But there's a lot of new things, a lot of new protocols, a lot of things that I haven't gone through yet at a Paralympics. I just keep going back to that little, little Russian girl who never gave up. And I think that's what's going to get me through. But I also think I'm at a really good point in my life where I truly know my worth, right? It's so easy to say, like, all of my life, I thought my worth truly came from these medals and sponsorships and world records and everything that I was, I was doing. And it is really hard to tell a 14-year-old girl um, that are like, your worth doesn't come from these medals. It comes from this. At, you know, at the time, I'm like, no, like, I need to keep winning. And it wasn't until Beijing in 2008 when I got a bronze medal that I, like, I was a world record holder and I got the bronze. And I remember going up to my parents in the stands and just being like, I think the first thing I said was, do you guys still love me? And I think that like shocked or like, will my dad still love me or something? So crazy, which is so crazy because now at this point in my life, going in Tokyo, I'm like a bronze medal would be incredible. <laughs> and I love that we're talking about this more, just the mental health of, you know, how silver and bronze are still incredible. And yes, I love the gold and that's what I'm obviously going for. But if I never bring home another gold in my life, I am more than enough. And maybe I can say that because I have won some gold, but also <laughs> like, you know, if you're not enough without a gold medal, you'll never be enough with one. And I'm just really thankful for my support system. I cannot wait to get home and see my husband. I haven't seen him for about three months by the time I get mm -hmm. home. And that's a long time for me being really <laughs> married. But um, I would just, I think she would just be really proud that I'm still swimming. You know, there's not a lot of people who are still swimming. My goal has always been to grow the Paralympic movement. Um, you know, I want people to, to know the Paralympics as much as they do the Olympics. And I love the coverage and, you know, what people are doing to grow it. And I hope I've played a small part in it. You played a big part, and we cannot wait to watch you swim. Um, also, what's what's next? What do you feel like? I mean, I hate sort of hate this question because you're like you haven't <laughs> even competed in Tokyo. But what what else? I, like you said, you're more than medals. Um, what are, what do you think is going to happen in the next chapter of your life? I don't know. I still plan to swim till LA 2028. So for me, swimming is the best form of exercise. I love it, and if I'm still performing, I I still really want to be a part of it. Um, but also I, I really want, um, to write a children's book and I love, I wrote a book with my sister. So I love that. I love public speaking and just encouraging others. I think in this world, we do need a lot of hope and we do need someone. And if I'm that person to give you inspiration to go out and try a new thing or just 
pursue your passions or your goals. And I feel like, again, I've done my job right. I remember being that 10 year old girl looking mm -hmm. around everywhere I went before the Paralympics and not seeing another person who looked like me ever. I remember just thinking I was the only person on the entire world that was missing two legs. So when I got involved in the Paralympics, it was the first time I started wearing shorts. It was the first time I started just embracing this, this body that I was given, right? I don't have legs. I'll never have legs. But I also decided from a very early age that I was not going to let this life that I was given go to waste. And I really hope to encourage the next generation. And I'm really excited for the Paralympic movement and, and what's to come. When you hear that you're so many little girls heroes, what goes through your mind? Oh my gosh. It's just the coolest thing because I know that, you know, everyone needs a hero. Everyone needs a role model. And, you know, I think social media can be a, such a wonderful thing, but also just such a dangerous thing with comparison. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something I really want to be is just embracing um, just who you are and, and the way that you were made. And I love the Paralympics because it has given me confidence. Sport just is so amazing for girls. And, you know, I, I've been involved with the Women's Sports Foundation for so long and I love what they do and Encompass, but um, just getting girls active and, and, and just gaining that confidence, right? Because I think when girls and women have confidence, we can truly take on the world. Oh, I'm inspired. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> Hello, today all day, summer's almost here, and if you're looking for the perfect way to welcome warmer weather, my pal Anthony Contrino is sharing his favorite al fresco meal. Not al loco, but al fresco. We're talking juicy pork milanese, peppery arugula salad, an easy anti-pasti, along with Uncle Pasti, with olives, and of course, a classic Italian cocktail to wash it all down. Mmm. Summer is just around the corner. It's not one of my favorite seasons, but my birthday's in there, so I'll allow it. Anyway, it is gonna be really nice to be able to dine outside with friends. So today I'm whipping up the perfect al fresco meal. I'll be making delicious orange rosemary marinated olives, the juiciest, crispiest pork milanese you've ever had, topped with a nice fresh salad. And then of course we need a cocktail or two. I'll be making a Negroni and an Americano. Oh, hi, I didn't see you there. Welcome to the new set of Saucy. Let's get cooking. I'm gonna be making some delicious orange rosemary marinated olives. We love olives in my family. We have them out for every holiday as part of an antipasti. I'm gonna be using orange and rosemary because those are two flavors that I like and that work really well together. So first things first, I have two different kinds of olives. My favorite, Caltavetrano, which are super buttery, and then a little bit more of a pungent flavor with Kalamata olives. I like the two to balance off each other, and they're really pretty when mixed up together later on. For the marinade itself, we'll start by adding some oil. It's about a third of a cup. You can eyeball this into a small saucepan. So first things first, an orange. Any sweet orange will do. This is a plain, navel orange, and I'm just cutting a few strips off. Then I like to go back with a knife and carefully, don't hurt yourself here, similar to like filleting fish, remove the bitter pith. We don't need any bitter flavor in our marinade over here. So you can see all the white part is gone and you're left with just the beautiful, super fragrant skin. Right into the pot that goes. Take your time. Better off being safe than sorry with this. And the last one into the pot. Don't want this orange to go to waste. So I'm gonna take that sweet, delicious juice and we'll add that to the pot as well. That'll add a little bit of sweetness to our olives. Next up, garlic. 
Why, why does this happen every time? Six takes later. I'm gonna grab two cloves. You can buy them peeled already, which will save on the aggravation. Okay, so just thin slice, eighth of an inch, even thinner if you can, without hurting yourself, into our pot. Then let's add some more flavor. A bay leaf. I'm gonna add a pinch of red pepper flakes. I'm not a big spice person, so I literally just add a tiny little pinch. Last but not least, some fresh rosemary. So I'm gonna cut off a couple of sprigs here and pull off about half of the leaves or just kind of break them. I just like the way it looks when it's in there. It's still gonna permeate that oil. So I'm literally just waiting for the edges to just sort of start to simmer as I'm doing this. It'll go pretty quickly. We're not looking to cook, we're looking to infuse. You'll know it's done when it gets nice and fragrant. Similar when you add garlic and onion to like a saute pan and it's getting there, it's smelling really good already. So you can see it's starting to simmer a little bit. So I'm gonna cut the heat and then simply just pour it right on top of our olives. Make sure you get all of this flavor. Leave no speck of garlic or rosemary behind. Okay, now I'm gonna let this sit out at room temperature for a couple of hours. So every now and then, every time you pass it, just pick it up, give it a tossy turn, zhuzh it up, get those olives coated nice with that oil to help marinate it, and give those olives some time to steep. Good morning, welcome to Today. Start your day with us every morning. Get your daily dose of news on the go with the Today Podcast. <laughs> and stream today anytime you want. Today, all day. Every day. Wherever you are, today is there. Some experts say that this bill still isn't enough. Do you accept that criticism? There's been a ton of confusion from the CDC. Can we try to clear some of this up? Is America safer today with the Taliban in charge of Afghanistan? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Make the most of your day with... Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show. In a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you what you must know. The biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. If there's one thing that I can eat for dinner every night, it's pork milanese, or any milanese. Chicken, anything, pound it thin, fry it crispy, I'm gonna eat it. I'd probably even enjoy shoe leather if it was fried. So right here I have, from my butcher, you can get these at most supermarkets, some nice, beautiful, thick pork loin chops that are boneless. I'm gonna pound them nice and thin so that every inch of this milanese is absurdly crispy. Get yourself a generous sized sheet of plastic wrap. And this is where the fun begins, guys. This may look a little scary, but I promise you it's not. We're going to butterfly these chops. So, I'm gonna place a chop on the plastic wrap, taking a really sharp chef knife I'm going to find the center and I'm going to cut it open like a book. Work slowly, deliberate, steady slices. And this is just to help get it 
nice and thin. And I'm just slowly going to start peeling it open. And there you go. If you skip this step and just start pounding, you're gonna be there all day and your meat's not gonna be as tender. So truly don't skip that step. Be sure to leave a little slack around so that our chop has room to grow. Get yourself one of these fun toys and go to town. Watch your fingers, don't do what I almost just did. There you have it. It's about a quarter of an inch thick and we have a gorgeous big cutlet now that is for one person. Just keep going. your kids or your boss piss you off today, this is the perfect meal to make at the end of the day. This one's even better. You can do this with chicken breast. I love it with chicken. You can do it with beef. If you don't have time to go to the gym, this is the perfect activity for you. what it feels like to exercise. <laughs> One to go. That looks great. As easy as that. I am going to wipe down, sanitize, clean my hands, and then we're going to dredge these guys up. Okay, now that that's set up, let's start getting these bad boys breaded. So, free them from the plastic wrap. Look how great that looks. Nice and thin. And when cooking, you wanna make sure you're seasoning in layers. You never wanna just finish with salt because it's just sitting on top and doesn't have time to absorb. Also, when cooking, you want to do all of one action at once. It keeps things neater, it's quicker. This is the bulk of the seasoning, so don't be cheap. And get both sides. The last one's always the annoying one, isn't it? Perfect. Now to begin breading. You may notice that there's something here missing, flour. Growing up, whenever my dad made chicken cutlets or milanese, he never used flour. And when I went to culinary school, I was like, "Where? What, what's with the flour? And I've tested it both ways. In this case, it is an extra ingredient, an extra step, and I find it to be completely unnecessary. It actually coats better to this pork if you don't use flour. So while you're probably thinking, I don't know what I'm talking about, I would curse here, but I'm not allowed to anymore. I definitely do. So this is my dredging station. Three very well beaten eggs and two cups of seasoned breadcrumb. Another trick, wet hand, dry hand. So in she goes. Make sure we're nice and well coated. You can see how great a pie dish works for this. It fits well, it has a flat enough surface and it has sides to keep everything in place. Give it a couple of shakes and right into our breadcrumb. Now, use your dry hand to start covering it with the breadcrumb. When you get to this point, you can flip it 
Make sure you don't miss a millimeter of breadcrumb. Every crevice, breadcrumb. And press it in. We want these to be well coated and super duper crispy. Just like that. And that's ready to be fried. Make sure you press it on, lock it in there. Isn't that cool? This is kind of a fun thing to get the kids involved in too. Put them to work. Dinner was not for free at my house growing up. Thank God I did most of the cooking. My mom's cooking's atrocious. That's a big one. Time to fry them up. I've added about a quarter of an inch of vegetable oil to a pot. When frying, I like to use a neutral oil like safflower, canola, any vegetable oil, because it won't take on any flavor. Have this going over medium high heat. And I know it's ready when I add a pinch of breadcrumb and we get some sizzle action. So you see how it foamed up and it already started darkening? Time to add one of our cutlets. We're gonna let this fry for about two to three minutes per side until it's deep, golden, gorgeous brown. Keep an eye on the edges of your cutlet. I can see it already starting to get nice and golden brown in that little nook, which means it's almost ready to flip. I'm gonna take a sneak peek. Almost there. For me, any cutlet should be on the brink of being burnt for it to be delicious. Now just another couple of minutes. Transfer it to a wire rack. If you put it on paper towels, it's gonna get a little soggy and the breading is gonna start to fall off. Get another one in really quick. And then while it's still hot, add a nice generous amount of a flaky sea salt. You can see it melting into that hot oil. Some of it won't melt. It'll add a little bit of an extra crunch and extra seasoning. These cutlets are gonna cook really quickly, so keep an eye on the pan. This is not the time to walk away and start another project. Oh my God. extra crispy for the chef. I have my oven set to the lowest setting. I'm gonna throw these in there to keep them warm. I don't wanna keep them in there too long though, just long enough to make a delicious salad. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Good morning, welcome to Today. Start your day with us every morning. Get your daily dose of news on the go with the Today Podcast. <laughs> and stream today anytime you want. Today, all day. Every day. Wherever you are, today is there. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're gonna
going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines, so crucial for reopening America. A big day around here, a very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. <laughs> Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! Some experts say that this bill still isn't enough. Do you accept that criticism? There's been a ton of confusion from the CDC. Can we try to clear some of this up? Is America safer today with the Taliban in charge of Afghanistan? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Good morning. Welcome to Today. Start your day with us every morning. Get your daily dose of news on the go with the Today podcast. <laughs> and stream today anytime you want. Today all day. Every day. Wherever you are, today is there. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. This peppery arugula is the base of my salad, but any good salad needs a killer dressing, and this is mine, my white balsamic dressing. Going to start by adding a couple of tablespoons of just plain old clover honey. This bougie thing looks like a lot of fun, but it's a little messy. This is gonna add just enough sweetness, some Dijon, which is gonna add more depth of flavor. It's also going to help emulsify this dressing when we add the oil. Get that all in there. Little bit of salt, about a half a teaspoon, and then about an eighth of a teaspoon of freshly cracked black pepper. Gonna whisk this to combine. Make sure you get that honey to dissolve. That looks beautiful. Now that the base of our dressing's ready, I'm going to drizzle in olive oil. Very slowly begin to drizzle in your olive oil, giving it time to break up the fat molecules and emulsify. If you can see the oil puddling in the vinegar, that means you're adding too much and it's going to not emulsify properly. I did not sign up for this much cardio today. You can see it already starting to thicken. That means that we have a great emulsification. It's a beautiful dressing. Great golden color from the white balsamic and this really good Sicilian olive oil. Mm, gorgeous, gorgeous. Mm, it's perfect, it doesn't need any more seasoning. This is a very simple salad. All I'm going to add to this arugula are some beautiful cherry tomatoes that I'm just gonna have if you don't have a small utility knife like this, a nice serrated knife, it's a really great kitchen tool. I use it a lot. I'm gonna give this a quick toss. And then add your dressing to taste. This makes more than you need for this, but it stores really well in the fridge in a mason jar or just any sealed container for at least a week. So all set. All that's left to do is to put the two pieces of the puzzle together. Mm. Smells so good. Okay. These are nice and warm. Let's go with this big guy. Just throw that right onto a plate and then don't be cheap. Oh, yes. 
Yes, 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 yes. Then, because God forbid I cook something and not put cheese on it. How delicious does this look? I cannot wait to dig in. I'm kind of thirsty. I think I need to make a cocktail. Stay connected and stream the news you need with Xfinity X5. Our top story is unfolding right now. The fast speed you depend on. We begin with breaking news right now in Florida. And a reliable connection for all your devices. This story matters to all of us. Whenever and however you watch. A bite-sized mix of everything you love, about all four hours of our show, but half the calories. Oh, oh yes. With Xfinity X5. Our top story is unfolding right now. The fast speed you depend on and a reliable connection for all your devices whenever and however you watch with Xfinity x -Fi. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. Show you how to make probably the most quintessential Italian aperitivo, which is a pre-meal drink, something meant to whet your appetite. And this bitter campati is going to do just that. That is one of the three major components in this Negroni. This drink is equal parts campati, sweet vermouth, and gin, and it is going to punch you in the face. So I'm doing an ounce and a quarter each of these three spirits. This is our sweet vermouth to balance that bitterness just the slightest bit. And we can't forget about the gin. This is a London dry gin that I'm using. Then some blood orange. I like to peel it directly into my beaker to catch any oils that come out. And I'm just going to peel off a nice healthy strip. Add some ice. You wanna get this nice and chilled. It's also gonna dilute this the slightest bit. And stir, stir, stir. At least 20 seconds. Really let those flavors combine and let it chill throughout. Perfect. Get yourself some bougie ice. Mmm. So pretty. Then, every cocktail needs a garnish. Another strip of our blood orange skin. Give it a little twist. And then I kind of like to run it on the rim just to get those oils on there. Little extra hint and punch of the orange. Now, if you feel like this is a little too bitter for your palate, we're gonna make its less aggressive cousin, the Americano, which is pretty similar. We're gonna start the same way with our Campati, using an ounce and a half this time. And then the sweet vermouth. No gin in this one. So it's not gonna be quite as boozy. Perfect. Same thing. And stir, stir, stir.
More bougie ice. <laughs> Isn't that such a beautiful color? Then, finally, we'll top it off with club soda. How beautiful that effervescence. Don't forget about our little garnish. Our little straw. There you have it, the perfect Negroni and the Americano. Can't wait to share these with my friends. It is a pretty color. And a little twist. Thank you. You stir. I like that it loose it a little. Welcome. This looks delicious. It's beautiful. It's all pork milanese. Nice. Thank you, Anthony. You're welcome. I think, I think when a lot of people think of the mother of the blues, I was thinking of, you know, Billie Holiday, I was thinking of Ella Fitzgerald, but mm -hmm. Ma Rainey came before all of them. Was yeah. Ma Rainey a role that you thought to yourself, boy, I, I hope one day I get to play that role? Not particularly. I mean, listen, there's lots of roles that you look like, look at and you say, I would love to play that role. It's not like I didn't want to play that role. It's just that, because of how I was exposed to it, I didn't see myself in that role, you know, which is, it's, it's very limited thinking, but you know what, you know, when you start acting and you come to Hollywood, you know, the disease that can metastasize very fast is limited thinking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I had limited thinking. I said, oh no, there's other actresses who can sing and they're older and they're, fabulous they could play that role but um no it wasn't me <laughs> <laughs> i would imagine the singing part was scary oh my word it is scary but once again i say this all the time you could talk to if someone did a biopic of my life you can talk to my husband you could talk to my daughter you could talk to my mother but you would only get 40 percent of me hmm. there's a huge part of who we are that exists in the internal and even with Ma Rainey, even though she was called the mother of the blues, that's only a small part of her story. It's a big part and it's a small part mm -hmm. of who she is. She's bisexual. She's a woman who was dark skinned, who was heavy set in the turn of the 20th century. So she literally fit all of the characteristics of people who were rendered invisible. And yet somehow she knew her worth. Like she fought, I feel like she fought every day to say, I'm worth it. I'm going to convince you I'm worth it. It looked like it was exhausting. Yeah. But she fought uh, yeah. through it. I'm going to remind you that I'm worth it. And, and here's the thing, Hoda, though. When I think of people of color and I define us in our world on our terms with autonomy and agency, there were a lot of Ma Rainey's. Mm -hmm. Ma Rainey is just sort of an anomaly to the public when you think in terms of how in the past um, white people have interpreted us. So we're always sort of an extension of the time period. So if it's 1927, the height of lynchings, the height of Jim Crow, then our heads were down, we were just self-effacing, we were apologetic. But in my world, when I think about my husband's mom and grandmother, when I think about my mom, these are women who always knew their worth. 
They own their bodies. They own their sexuality. And that's the beauty of August Wilson. Mm -hmm. You know? He, I mean, he spoke truth. I mean, every time you saw one of his, I was just looking back to an old interview you and I did. It was when you were doing Fences. Yeah. And it was as moving in that moment. And I'm having the exact same feels that I'm having in this moment. But did you, I mean, knowing one's worth is something that I think a lot of people struggle with. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you always know your worth? No, not at all. I mean, I, because, and in my defense, this is what I will say, that one of the things that happens oftentimes with people is you always feel like you have to do something to earn that worth. Hmm. That you have to have a degree, that you have to have looks, that you have to have some kind of high standings. And somewhere along the line in life, you just realize, no, I was born, I'm breathing. <laughs> And therefore, I'm just worthy. I'm just worthy because I am. And, and so that has been a learning curve for me, that I, I just feel that I have value. <laughs> and then it becomes about always reminding people of your value. <laughs> That's the hard part. Well, you know what's funny? I mean, I see your Oscars, your Tonys, and your Emmy, and all those things. And I was looking back to an, an old Meryl Streep speech at the SAG Awards in 2009. And one of the things that came out of her mouth was, my God, someone give Viola Davis a movie. Yeah. And I thought it was both beautiful and also the fact that it had to be said from the podium like that somehow was not upsetting to me, but it moved me in a way. Um, they, 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 even Meryl had to be reminding people to give you a role. What did you think in that moment? I thought it was very nice what she mm -hmm. said. Yes. I was very moved because I love her more than anyone can love a human being. But also, I mean, I have to say in a lot of interviews, people mention that. Mm -hmm. And um, there, there's good and bad in that. The good part of that is, you know, we're, we're, we're peers, me mm -hmm. and Meryl. And it was a beautiful gesture of her recognizing my talent and, and, and saying it, you know. But at the same time, does Meryl Streep have to say that in order to give me worth? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, does that mark the time that there was Viola before that time and there was Viola after that time that mm -hmm. Meryl said that. But I think that we're in the day and age where we're really understanding that everybody is fighting for space now. Mm -hmm. We really are. We're fighting for space. And here's the thing. We should fight for space. And we should fight for space because really, at the end of the day, everybody has to feel their worth. Mm -hmm. Do you ever get tired of, of fighting yeah. for space? Do you ever get tired? You do. I mean, I know that you do as a woman, yeah. you yeah. know, because how we're valued. You, you do You get tired of fighting for it. But you know what? The hardest fight is the fight within yourself. Mm. I think once, you once you've conquered that, you're good. People know my story, coming out of poverty, coming out of domestic violence, <laughs> with family that I really, really loved. But it was just a really difficult moment that I had when my parents were fighting and I started screaming and I couldn't stop. Obviously I was experiencing trauma at nine and I ran into the bathroom and I got on my knees and I put my hands together and I prayed to God to take me out of this life. I said, I'm gonna give you until the count of 10 and when I open my eyes, I want you to have plucked me out of this life because I can't take it anymore. And I counted to 10 and I opened my eyes and I was still there. And I thought to myself, well, God, do you even exist? Do you even see me? But it was only in hindsight that I realized that he kept me there for a very specific reason. That because of the life I've had, hard is relative to me. I understand poverty. I understand domestic violence. I understand what it means to live without food. And, and it's really helped me in service position because it's like they say, you can only help people if you feel them in your heart. And I feel them in my heart because I was kept in that, in that situation to feel it, 
Now it's undeniable to me. I, I don't see people who are on the periphery as I see them. They are not invisible to me because they are a part of me. I always say the little Viola is always waking up with me, tapping me on the shoulder, saying, what are you gonna give me today, Viola? <laughs> is it gonna be some ice cream? Or are you gonna just let me hug you and be excited about my future? You know, um, she's always there. And I have to think of my life like that because otherwise, it can't be about the golden statues. Mm -hmm. you know, it can't be. Good morning, welcome to you today. Nice to have you with us. We wanted to surprise Ellie and make her wish come true. What do you think about coming to visit us? Yes. There's only one thing that people are saying. Like, you are <laughs> bad. <laughs> For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show. In a mere 30 minutes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready, are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Well, you, you know, it's funny. When I watch you in these roles, I often wonder, you, there's acting, and then there's a feeling that seems to transcend acting. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know a lot of people are beautiful actors, and they can inhabit a role, but sometimes when I watch you, I wonder, like, I feel like you've felt that before. I felt like, I feel like you might have lived that before. I feel like you understand that from a, a way that other actors and actresses don't. Well, I say that I'm an, an observer of life. It's not a lot of things that I play in characters that I've experienced, but I've, I've observed it in other people. Mm -hmm. I'm probably looking at you now and seeing things that you don't even think <laughs> that people see. It's, it's just in every actor. We are observers and we're thieves. We, we, we have a greater empathy. And then when we have to play a role, we use all those observations and we pour it into the role because we have to be sort of the keepers of humanity. Mm -hmm. Without judgment, <laughs> just the keepers of humanity. But I, I mean, I don't know. I sort of love people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I do. Even when they get on my nerves, I sort of love them. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about um, you talk about in your in in your talks, which I was I watched one with Tina Brown. I watched a bunch of them, and I was again so moved. But you talked about the difference between having goals and having a purpose. Yeah. What what's what's your purpose? Well, my purpose, I have to say, continually changes. I'm I'm sort of in the Michelle Obama plane. Uh, of her, uh, her book, Becoming, because that's what it is, right? You're always becoming something else. There's always a new goal to focus on. You know, I'm halfway through my life. I mean, right now, my main purpose right now is to help people feel the things that I never felt when I was a kid growing up. The sort of invisibility of both blackness, poverty, and womanhood. I don't want anyone to feel that. I think that when, when people feel seen and they feel valued, I think that that's 90% of the work with them sort of mm. working towards becoming their ideal self and having the passion to do that. But so oftentimes, because we live in sort of a, a, of a caste system, mm -hmm. a status system, that there's the only people that we see are the people who are on top. Mm. The rest, 
we sort of relegate to the back. I'm not saying everyone does that, but I don't want that to be my purpose. That's why I have the production company that's dedicated to the broad spectrum of humanity, those narratives that really emphasize people of color, people in the LGBTQ community. There are great stories coming mm -hmm. from, you know, people who've been on the sidelines too much. Mm -hmm. If I were to focus on that being a bit, that would be the main vision and purpose. But, you know, talk to me in 10, 20 years. <laughs> and they, my purpose may be sitting on the beach in Hawaii and scratching my feet. And having a cocktail, I hope. Or three. <laughs> yes, exactly. I like that. I like that. You said that you talked about when you when you came from abject poverty, but you you describe a moment where you saw Cicely Tyson. Yeah. Because you'd never seen anything modeled for you that felt right. And when you saw her, it felt like home, I guess. It was magic moment. It was that it was it was magic. It was, it was one of those moments that you can't even define except in the abstract, which is I found that thing that I wanted to do with my life. I found it with looking at that unbelievably brilliant artistic performance. And there is an understanding, Hoda, with artists of color, because you know I did the whole gamut, the undergraduate degree, went to Juilliard. There's, there's a feeling that there, there's no craft involved in acting when it comes to us. We're sort of playing another version of who we are. They, they do the same thing with athletes. It's sort of an innate talent. We're not outliers. We don't have craft. But when I looked at Miss Tyson, I saw craft mm -hmm. in the same way you see it in, you know, anyone from Meryl Street to Judy Dench to anyone. Mm -hmm. I, I saw someone who literally could go out there and learn something. <laughs> and it can transform them. And I said, that's what I want. And I want people to throw flowers at me. That's what I wanted. I literally said that. I want <laughs> people to throw flowers at me. That's my ego, I think. <laughs> and they do, yeah. they do. Stay connected and stream the news you need with Xfinity x -Fi. Our top story is unfolding right now. The fast speed you depend on and a reliable connection for all your devices, whenever and however you watch with Xfinity x -Fi. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Good morning. Welcome to Today. Start your day with us every morning. Get your daily dose of news on the go with the Today Podcast. <laughs> and stream today anytime you want. Today All Day. Every day. Wherever you are, today is there. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Some experts say that this bill still isn't enough. Do you accept that criticism? There's been a ton of confusion from the CDC. Can we try to clear some of this up? Is America safer today with the Taliban in charge of Afghanistan? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Can we talk about the other bright light in your life? And you have a lot of them, but adopting Genesis when she yeah. was a baby. She's now 10 years old. I still can't believe it. Yes. Um, how, how do you think motherhood transformed you? It transforms you by getting getting you out of the way, getting you out of the way, you know, and making you focus on a higher purpose. Hmm. And it's transformative in that way, I think. In me, you know, it's like, 
I have to tell Genesis she's beautiful, <laughs> she's worthy, she's capable. I have to, I have to put her to task. And in doing that, I'm healing myself. I'm doing it to me. It's like I can hear myself. It's like, you know, and, and, you know, the other day, I think I actually did it the other day. I was like, you could do it, Genesis. You could do it. And she was like, well, what about you too, mommy? <laughs> and I was like, that's it. You know, um, she's just been the biggest light in my life. I mean, you talk about purpose and vision. Um, she's absolutely up there. Have you uh, forgiven all, all the people in your life you need to forgive? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I have. And I can actually, I, I can actually say that I have. Yeah. Wow. That's a big statement. Yeah. It's a big statement. I wonder, you, you always seem so clear. There's like a clearness about you. So you look like someone who has, who has forgiven people. You're but not I, carrying it. Uh, I, I, I can't carry it anymore. It's like, I always, you know, talk about that saying forgiveness is giving up all hope of a different past. Mm. And, and, and I know that the people who were in my life, like my dad, you know, who passed in 2006, my mom is still with, with us. It's just, they did the best they could with what they had. Mm -hmm. And now that I understand where it's all coming from, I mean, I listen, I forgive them everything. I love, love my parents and my mm -hmm. family. You, you've also said this in, a, uh, in some of your speeches, you said that the two most important days in your life are the day you're born and the day you figure out why. Yeah. Um, have you figured out your why specifically yet? Not really. I yeah. mean, listen, there's lots of whys, you know, it's like someone just said, you start a race off, you run on par with everyone who's running with you. And then halfway through you're running on par with someone who's at your same pace. And it's only maybe three quarters of the way through the race that you begin to run your own race. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not at, I'm not necessarily at that point yet. I mean, listen, I feel like I live for love. I do that. The love of my husband and my daughter, my mom and my, my family. I mean, for me, that's everything. I think that probably when we get to the end, end of our lives, that's probably going to be the only thing that's left. Yeah, there was. Um, you know, but I don't know. I, yeah. I think there's a lot of things I live for. Well, you're at the bomb. I was just, there was, uh, I can't remember who said this, but he said, there's the resume you and the eulogy you. The resume <laughs> you is what they talk about while you're around. The eulogy is what they say after, after yeah. you passed away. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling the eulogy you is about a thousand times better than your resume you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, let, uh, let's go through just a couple of rapid fires. Uh, first thing that comes to your mind when I ask you this, what's the one thing you cannot leave the house without? A head scarf. Wait, say that again? Head scarf. A head scarf. Okay. Head. okay. I heard I just heard the scarf part. Okay, yeah. head scarf. <laughs> what is the one misconception people have about you? That I'm always serious. I'm a lot of fun. That's the one I'm I'm trust me, I am so much fun. <laughs> You got the best laugh on earth. I know that for sure. Uh, what is the one thing or person who inspires you right now in this moment? Oh, my mom. Mm -hmm. In every single way, she inspires me. Her heart is bigger than the world. I like that. Uh, yeah. how, do, how does you're 55, Viola? I'm 55. How does 55 feel? Fantastic. It feels a whole lot better than 28. See, 28 is that age older than I'm stuck at. I was making all the worst decisions in my life, especially with boyfriends. So 55 is much better than 28. Your man, you got your wonderful daughter, you got a oh career that goodness. you dreamt of, yes. Yeah, I got a little bit of money in the bank. I got a refrigerator full of food. I was a starving artist at 28. <laughs> Oh, Viola, I love you. I adore you. I can't tell you um, how meaningful this is for me. So thank you. Thank you. Stay connected and stream the news you need with Xfinity XFi. Our top story is unfolding right now. The fast speed you depend on and a reliable connection for all your devices, whenever and however you watch with Xfinity XFi. 
Good morning. Welcome to Today. Start your day with us every morning. Get your daily dose of news on the go with the Today podcast. <laughs> Boom. Boom. And stream today anytime you want. Today, all day. Every day. Wherever you are, today is there. Let's go. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Good morning. Welcome to Today. Start your day with us every morning. Get your daily dose of news on the go with the Today podcast. <laughs> Boom. And stream today anytime you want. Today, all day. Every day. Wherever you are, today is there. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Guilty pleasure reading. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, the what Kristen Stewart. Um, <gasps> the, Twilight. Uh, I read them in less than a week. I thought that they were kind of hot. And then I read it and I was like, I, this is like a week and a half of my life I can't get back. But I love those books yes. when I read them. I am here with Viola Davis for Open Book. Thank you so much Absolutely. for chatting all things books with yeah. me. I read that when you were growing up in Rhode Island, that <laughs> books were a refuge for you. It was a refuge. It was an escape into my imagination where I could be anyone I wanted to be and I could go anywhere I wanted to go. So I went to the library. Every day I would walk when I was in kindergarten. I would walk to the library and I'd stay there until nighttime and I would walk home. I also read that Elise, the trusted librarian, was like a friend. Like oh a yes. Mentor. Well, she was a friend because it was like it was almost like Pavlov's dog. <laughs> as soon as I got there, she would give me half of her lunch, <laughs> which was always a tuna fish sandwich and a brownie, mm -hmm. and I would devour it. And then I would go into the children's section of the library. When you think back to being in that children's section, what do, books do you remember reading? Everything from Dr. Seuss. Mm -hmm. Everything from the corduroy books. I mean, I remember the smell of the pages. Was there a favorite when you were little or something that you remember reading and just thinking, or even maybe an adolescent thinking like, wow, now this. The first, first book I ever read that changed my life was Claude Brown's Man Child in the Promised Land. I think I read it when I was 13 and I could not believe it. It was a memoir about um, this African-American man growing up in Harlem and the whole drug crisis, mm -hmm. you know, in the 20s. And just, it shifted me as a person. That's what it did, it shifted me as a person. How important is it that kids or, or teens can see themselves, can see their culture, can see somebody that looks like them in the books that they read? You know, it's like uh, Albert Einstein says, said, he said, imagination is more important than knowledge. Because I think that sometimes a culture can limit you in your identity mm -hmm. as a woman, as a woman of color, and it's only in books and it's only in stimulating your imagination that sometimes you can see your possibilities, mm -hmm. you know? And, and also, it's just entertaining, you know? I, I just feel like it's entertaining. That's why I became an actor. I, 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 that's why I love acting. You like to entertain. Yes, and I like pretending <laughs> I'm somebody else. You said earlier when we were chatting that plays were like this opening into this world that you would eventually Absolutely. go into. I'm, I'm, I'm an introvert. I'm, I'm actually very shy, even though I always tell people <laughs> I'm a whole lot more fun than you think I am. You have a lot of laughs. I think me. I would have fun. But with I'm you. I'm very very introverted, and so I used to love holding up in my house reading plays. I would read Eugene O'Neill, mm. even as a young teenager. Um, Shakespeare, Winter's Tale is my favorite. Mm. Macbeth, and I would read you know um, all things August Wilson. You know Arthur Miller. Mm -hmm. Arthur Miller absolutely just shifted me in a whole way with Death of a Salesman, mm -hmm. View from the Bridge. Um, I consider that to be 
you know, they call it dramatic literature. And I would pretend to be all of those characters in it. And uh, yeah. It was the foreshadowing into your career. Yeah, now I'm like, <laughs> when am I gonna retire? I'm tired. <laughs> You're like, I don't even have time to read the new J.K. Rowling. I got an eight-year-old. <laughs> what do you read to your, to your daughter? What do you read to her? You know what? I read now. My husband uh, gave me um, a book for our anniversary, and they're all love poems by Emily Dickinson, Dickinson Pablo yes, Neruda. Yes, those are romantic. And, and they're all romantic. And so we read those together. And how I get her to read it is I say, okay, say the name of the author, Genesis, but um, do it nonsensical. <laughs> Just make believe. So she'll go, Pablo, um, uh, Pinky brains or something. I say, okay, read his poem. And then she reads me his poem. That's how I get her to read it, by making it fun, by making it like, silly. you know, silly. And she reads me some of the greatest love poems, especially before we go to sleep, you know? So that's- Is that like a uh, love poem in itself? You're sitting with your, your yeah. daughter reading love poetry? Are you like, this is what life is supposed to be like? Yes, except when I go, Genesis, do you know how powerful that is? Mommy is crying right now. She's like, okay, mommy, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's Pablo Neruda, Genesis. <laughs> Welcome to Today All Day. All day? Today All Day. All day. This is a long oh, way of man. asking, yeah, who's your okay. favorite character you've ever oh, played? Right. The unicorn. The unicorn. You gotta have the unicorn. <laughs> What is she right there? That's why you're saying all these nice things? Yeah, she gave me the, the look. Sorry to disturb your day. Everyone's mad at you, Willie. Better make this fast. I don't want the wrath of Luna. Okay, if there's one person who agrees with the old saying, you are what you eat, it's our health and nutrition editor, Madeline Fernstrom. Yeah, yesterday we talked about the foods that are good for your hair and your skin and your nails. So if you missed that, you can check out our new podcast. <laughs> and today we're tackling the best foods to boost your energy. Okay, Madeline's leading us in a game called Best Food Friends so we can figure out which food combos provide a one-two punch of energy Hey, Madeline. Hey, Madeline. It's good to Hi, see you. Hi, how are you? Oh, Always good to see you. We, we love you and we miss you. Okay, but let's talk about this because I didn't realize that no. a food combination, a one-two punch, could be something that, you know, changes how your body feels. And, you know, the, the important thing here is, is picking the right foods because you want to have some energy now and later. And if you pick a healthy carbohydrate, and a fat protein uh, compound, then you're gonna have the energy now and energy later. You need that burst of energy from a carbohydrate, a healthy mm -hmm. one like fruits or vegetables or a whole grain, and then sustained energy from a fat protein combination that takes longer to digest. So when you combine them in the right way, you'll be all That's set. Good. Energy yeah, now like, and later. Okay, Madeline, really quickly, because we want to get to this game, are there any foods you shouldn't pair? Yeah, there are no no's. Okay. There, there are no bad matches as long as you take the different categories, a carbohydrate food and, and, a, and a fat protein food, and you're good. Two carbs will just give you quick energy, but not later. But okay. let's get to our game. Okay, yes. great. So what we're going to do is make the best match of which two go together. So there are certain matches, the best fit. So Hoda, why don't we start with you? Okay. Which I'm, two do you think go together pick. the best that are? I know. I know exactly which two. Carrots and hummus. Good one. Ah, and... You would be right. Oh, I would. Carrots and hummus. Yes, you did. That's a good one. The carrots and hummus are a great choice because carrots are a healthy carb with just a touch of, of, mm -hmm. of fruit sugar. And then the hummus has that fat protein punch because tahini is the sesame fat along with chickpeas and some protein. That's a good one. Okay, Jenna, why don't you try next? Okay, I, I think you're trying to trick me with the cheese and crackers just because that's my very favorite combination yeah. of all things. So I'm gonna say cheese and grapes. And Jenna, you would be right. Yes, You're, I knew it. Don't follow the shiny ball. Okay. There, there you go. Because 
Grapes and cheese are a perfect combo because actually grapes are nature's candy. It's a really wonderful fruit. It's a pure carbohydrate and the fat protein in your cheese will give you that slower, slower digested energy along with a pop of calcium. I'm okay. just gonna take that as wine, wine and, cheese. and cheese. They're the perfect yes. combo. <laughs> Thank you for that, Madeline. I will that report that too. to everyone and I know. the crackers and peanut butter together. Okay. okay. So crackers and peanut butter. Yeah, of course. Okay, that's right. Good. That you know, that's what's left. What doesn't go well with that? Take some whole wheat crackers. You get that carbohydrate. That's a healthy carb as well, along with peanut butter. That's going to give you healthy fat and some protein, and that goes perfectly well together. What so a, you've got three great combos. They're economical and they're portable. Okay. Um, you Madeline, can do it. Thank you. That was <laughs> awesome. It's You're great welcome. to see you. For more tips on what Always to eat for more to energy, you. go to hodaandjenna.com. Mm -hmm. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Good morning. Welcome to you today. Nice to have you with us. We wanted to surprise Ellie and make her wish come true. What do you think about coming to visit us? Yes. There's only one thing that people are saying. Like, you are <laughs> bad. <laughs> make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends in today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, boom. Yes, yes, yes. Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day Kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Stay connected and stream the news you need with Xfinity X5. Our top story is unfolding right now. The fast speed you depend on and a reliable connection for all your devices, whenever and however you watch with Xfinity X5. Good morning. Welcome to you today. Nice to have you with us. We wanted to surprise Ellie and make her wish come true. What do you think about coming to visit us? Yes. There's only one thing that people are saying. Like, you are <laughs> bad. <laughs> For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Sometimes the best solutions to our problems aren't found in the drugstore, they're found in the grocery store. Yeah, so NBC News Health and Nutrition Editor Madeline Furnstrom is about to show us some easy fixes for your ailments and they are right in your own kitchen. Madeline, Madeline. it's good to see you. All right, so. To the first question though, yeah. Madeline, we have a, some of our viewers that have some questions about this. Let's go to Justice from Columbia, South Carolina to see what they need help with. Jenna, while I am so happy that it is the summertime and I'm happy for the weather and everything, my skin is super, super dry, especially on my legs, and I just don't know what to do. All right, let's hear it. Justice, don't want, she doesn't want dry skin and nobody does. So what, what's good do. for that? Okay, the best thing, Justice, and everyone is to add some fat to your diet because you need water hydration, but fat is sort of the overall lubricant to keep your cells uh, functioning. Skin is the biggest organ, it's all over. So add a fat like um, avocados. Here, here we go, um, Madeline. Yeah, I'm here doing we go. We're going to take a look at this. Oh, let's oh, reveal. Avocados and tomatoes. tomatoes. Why do these right. work? Two of the best ones. Mm -hmm. The avocado is a heart healthy fat. You can use it on anything. You can mash it. You can put it on a mm -hmm. sandwich or a salad. Um, and you can use other fats like nuts. But tomatoes are a surprise because they are a huge nutrient powerhouse. And it gives you loads of antioxidants. It prevents cellular damage. You're going to have um, a bunch of vitamins, vitamin C, vitamin E, potassium. And it's easy to incorporate every day. The most All important right. thing about having food for the outside is going to be you eat it every day. Got awesome. it. All right. So we got a viewer, Michelle. She's got a problem that lots of us can relate to. Take a listen. Hi, this is Michelle from Scottsdale, Arizona. And during the hot months of the summer, my hair gets so dry and brittle. I was wondering, do you have any advice or any tips that can help solve this problem? Shall we, we see? We have a reveal, Madeline, Let's see. and the winner is okay. Ooh, almonds and uh, eggs. Uh, almonds and so eggs. Almonds and eggs. Now, the big key here is when you have brittle or dry or damaged hair, protein is great. And one of the best proteins are eggs because they are the best digested by the body. They're full of B vitamins, especially biotin. That's really important for hair health. Remember, any small 
deficiencies in your diet can really be reflected in problems in your skin, hair, and nails. And especially if you say, oh, eggs, the American Heart Association goes, mm. these are great for healthy eating. Mm. One a day, seven eggs a week are going to be great. And also remember that yolk, that's going to be good. It's got a lot of antioxidants and some vitamin E, so you can't go wrong. And <laughs> almonds, one of Hoda's, one yeah. of Hoda's favorites is a top combo because it's got those healthy fats that you need for vibrant hair as well as protein. It's got two thirds of your vitamin E. Mm -hmm. So you really got a nutrient mm -hmm. powerhouse both with proteins in the eggs and the almonds. And they're Ma filling too. Magdalene, really quickly, let's get to our viewer, Sarah, see what she has going on. Yeah. Hoda, Jenna, I need your help. Every summer, my nails get so cracked and spotty. What should I do? Okay. Here's the reveal, Magdalene. This is what Here's we do, reveal. Sarah. Mmm, raisin, raisin bran and asparagus, right. what a strange combo. And asparagus, now where does this come? Any whole grain, bran cereal is great because it's a good source, is a great source of zinc and B vitamins. Any problems with nails usually have some vitamin or mineral deficiencies mm. or marginal ones, so bran cereal is a great choice. And the raisins are full of iron. That's so important for women's health, and a lot of women are marginally deficient. If you like liver, you can try that. The asparagus is another nutrient powerhouse. It hits all the nutrient bases. It's low in calories. It's got a ton of folic acid, vitamin A, A, C, E, K. I mean, it's a whole powerhouse of everything you need and some lesser known nutrients that you need like phosphorus and, and copper and a bunch of iron. So incorporate these every day. Food's not going to have that impact unless you have it regularly. But oh. any problems and these don't go away or solve it. See your doctor because it might be something yeah, else. Madeline, right. these are thank all, you. These are all Great things tips. we have in our houses anyway, Madeline. Exactly. Thank you we so appreciate much. that. Thank you, Madeline, for more tips on what to eat for your hair, skin, and nails. Go to hodaandjenna.com. Once I felt what it felt like to breathe for the first time and get that full breath of air, I think it unlocked something where I just wanted to keep exploring. For Kaylee Dunnewald, lifelong health issues led her on a mission. Take me back to why you ever started exploring plant-based diets. Growing up, I suffered really severe cases of both asthma and allergies and saw all these doctors and specialists and every one of them told me this is just the way I was born. But then when I was 25 years old, I was living in Bali, Indonesia and embarked on a plant-based diet. Kaylee says within two weeks, her symptoms disappeared. I really felt like it was my mission in life to share this really powerful story with more people to let them know that you really have more agency around your health than you might realize. She embarked on a career change, first becoming a health coach and inspiring others to view food as medicine. It was very, very powerful work, but once I, kind of a year and a half in, I ultimately felt like I needed to make a bigger impact. And so if I could really target the root cause of at least what a lot of these people are suffering from, it's just the food being offered to consumers. And she did, targeting a rather unexpected food. How did you decide ice cream was this niche area that you wanted to focus on? I thought that that would be a really powerful place to start because proving that you can do that in a nutrient dense way really shows that you can do it pretty much anywhere. In 2017, Kaylee launched Sacred Surf, a plant-based gelato made with young coconut meat and packed with superfoods and nutrition. In a thing of ice cream, we've got activated charcoal, tiger nut flour, and mucuna purines. It, it sounds healthy, but I don't know what they are. <laughs> so we really tried to recreate this nostalgic cookies and cream, but really only working with nutrient dense ingredients. So our hero in that flavor is tiger nut flour, which tiger nuts are actually not a nut at all. They're this root vegetable and they're packed with resistant starch. So really good for your digestive health. I like to cook and there are certain healthy ingredients that are just really hard to make work. What was the trial and error process like? What makes ice cream really rich and creamy is a lot of fat, a lot of sugar, and gums and stabilizers. And we don't use any of that. This young Thai coconut meat, it's a pulp material. So it's got a lot of extra fiber and that's what lends itself to the really rich and creamy texture. Two years later, Whole Foods started stocking Sacred Serve. What was that moment like? Very surreal. I wanted the product to work. I wanted people to love it. And we were really, really well received. But the cherry on top? Kaylee not only figured out a way to make ice cream relatively healthy for customers, but for the environment, too. I think one of the coolest things is, is the actual packaging. I had 
no idea that the regular carton that you get regular ice cream in is not actually biodegradable, is not recyclable. How is this, this carton different? What people don't recognize is because it looks like paper, there's actually a thin plastic lining on the inside that acts as a moisture barrier that essentially renders it trash. And so what we've done is we've replaced that plastic moisture barrier with a water-based barrier. So there's no plastic at all in our container, which makes it fully recyclable, compostable, and biodegradable right at home. Cookies and cream. As for the taste test, Mama. looks like a thumbs up. Mama. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Stay connected and stream the news you need with Xfinity X5. Our top story is unfolding right now. The fast speed you depend on. We begin with breaking news right now in Florida. And a reliable connection for all your devices. This story matters to all of us. Whenever and however you watch. A bite-sized mix of everything you love, about all four hours of our show, but half the calories. Oh, oh yes with Xfinity X5. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines, so crucial for reopening America. A big day around yes. here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring is sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! Stay connected and stream the news you need with Xfinity X5. Our top story is unfolding right now. The fast speed you depend on and a reliable connection for all your devices whenever and however you watch with Xfinity X5. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. We are back with a food trend that we've been hearing a lot about lately, meatless meat. It's made to look and taste like the real thing. It's also become big business. In just a year, plant-based meat sales have increased by 26%, bringing in more than $800 million. More restaurants are adding it to the menu. More options are popping up in stores as well. But is it really a healthier option? Dave Zinko is a Today Health and Wellness contributor. He is also founder of Eat This, Not That, of course. Always good to have hey, you. Hey, great to see you, Craig. So these are all the rage now. All the all rage. The, first of all, what constitutes, I guess, meatless meat, fake meat, if you will? Well, first of all, it's meat that's made from plants. Okay. That's, that's number one. And then these companies were able to basically replicate almost perfectly the taste, the texture, the chemical composition of burgers in this case, and, and unlike a typical veggie burger of the past, they are trying to get it to taste like meat so that you'll, you'll eat more of that. And, and even less when you cook them, I've noticed meat. that they even cook yes. like your traditional burgers. Exactly the same. Right, exactly so this, is the a, same. this is a regular burger. Right. So, I know what these taste like, so let's... This well, is... if, we, if we go through the nutrition, oh, okay. the nutritionals on them, and what you're going to see is that for something like, like beef, it's going to come in... And feel free to try any of these. It's going to come in at about 287 calories normally. It's got uh, 75 milligrams of sodium, which is, which is great. It's got 23 grams of fat and about 8.6 grams of saturated fat. That's, that's where we are with the traditional beef. Okay. That's okay. the regular beef. Yeah. Then, then we move over to Impossible, and that's coming in at about 240 you know, calories. So you're saving you know, around 40 then um, it's got 14 grams of fat, which is you're saving there. It's got um, uh, about the same saturated fat and a little bit more sodium. Okay. How about the uh, and then, Beyond Meat Burger? And then for Beyond... I've actually had these on a number of occasions. Yeah, this is, this is like um, Impossible coming in at around 250 calories, a little bit higher um, when it comes to sodium, but... But fat is uh, much less fat and, uh, and a lot less saturated fat. Six grams of saturated fat is great because women should get about 20 grams a day. So on the whole, Dave, are these, these meatless burgers 
healthier for you than the traditional counterparts? They're not necessarily healthier because the manufacturers are trying very hard to, to give you a plant-based meat alternative. They want it to, so, so it's going to have similar uh, saturated fat, fat, sodium, and, and calories. However, it's, it's better for you in two important distinctions. It's better for, for you for uh, eating less red meat because mm -hmm. we eat about two, point, uh, two and a half burgers worth of red meat a day, which is five times more than we should. And, and beyond that, it's much better for the planet. It's much more sustainable. So if you're you know, thinking about the environment and you're trying to eat you know, less red meat. And that, that um, new UN report just yeah, out this yeah, morning yeah, speaks to that. Yeah, this is a, right, so no animals were harmed in the making of these products. It's not just these, these, these burgers that we're talking about. This meatless trend is now, it's everywhere. Everywhere, Sausages. everywhere and it's exploding and they are mastering the taste. What do taste we have dominates here? everything. Um, these are uh, sausage-based um, varieties, Beyond Meat, Beyond Sausage, um, which is terrific. Um, and this is a light life um, sausage, plant-based. And both of them have half the total fat. Um, I mean, that tastes your, like sausage. It's, it really is amazing. Wait till you, wait till you try this other one, too. Um, they're both lower in calories. Uh, and uh, you, it's, it, it looks, it sizzles, and it satisfies like normal sausage. Now, these, I would assume, are healthier than your traditional sausage. The, nutritionally, they are, they, they are better. Okay. And this is overall, a, I mean, overall, and this uh, you know, Light Life has been um, doing this since 1979 and um, was well ahead of the trend. What do we have here? Okay, so here now we got the bef before the butcher. Uh, this is a breakfast sausage. What's great about this one is it's it fits perfectly on an English muffin. Ah. Um, it's an award winner, and uh, you're basically getting less sodium and double the protein. Um, this one over here is chorizo from Abbott the Butcher, and it is uh, basically uh, developed in a kitchen, not in a, not in a lab, All right. which is great. It has a very flavorful. Now, these look just like chicken nuggets. Yes, yes. This is raised and rooted plant-based nuggets. This is actually um, Tyson-owned, and it's the only non-vegan option here because it does contain egg whites. Um, but it's, uh, That tastes just like a, like a chicken nugget. It's amazing, right? This stuff it does I mean, not just taste like, a like fake meat. Um, this right here is Nugs. Um, what's really interesting about this company <laughs> is that they're constantly updating their formula. So, so they keep making it a better and better chicken nugget that's plant-based. So, In terms of health. Yeah, so a year ago they had version 1.0, and now today they have 1.3.1, which is a year later. Now, what is, what is this? And then this is Good Catch Tuna. So, fake fish? So what's that? This is fake fish. This is, uh, and it's safe for those with uh, shellfish allergens. Um, so what you're getting here is a lot of the omega-3 um, fatty acids that you wouldn't necessarily get if you didn't like fish or were allergic to it um, in this good catch tuna. Have you tried that? I tried it. It's great. Is it? You, you weren't. I'm, a, I'm not a tuna guy. I'll taste it. Um, yeah. But I'm not. Is this in terms of like health? Is yeah. this just as this good? Is, this is uh, this is nutritionally, it's uh, it, it's really great because you get the omega threes. Yeah, eh. I'm, not a, I'm not a tuna guy. Okay, but, you know, well, if you're into that, you're into that. Thank you. Yeah. We always learn Absolutely. something when you're here. Thank you, Dave Zinko. The race to carve up the meat market is heating up. This week, Impossible Foods beefed up its roster of meat alternatives, serving up new plant-based pork and sausage. So I can see there's the sizzle, you have the fat coming out of it. You can also get the aromas. It smells like pork, yeah. it looks like pork. All without the pig. Award-winning chef Tracy Desjardins advised Impossible on the new pork. We're seeing a lot of consumers, especially millennials, who really want to make that choice not to eat animals anymore um, because of the environmental impact. And this is a product that can satisfy all of their meaty needs. Okay, here right. we go. We were among the very first outsiders to taste test it. What do you think? Oh, good. If you were tasting that side by side with ground pork, would you, would you know the difference? I don't know that I would. Yeah. Impossible says their pork has zero cholesterol, 40% less saturated fat, and more iron. Meat alternatives are predicted to explode, rising from $14 billion of the global meat industry right now to $140 billion by 2029. Impossible Foods already has lucrative deals with big names like Burger King, Red Robin, and White Castle, with more to come. 
You'll find competitor Beyond Meat served at Carl's Jr., Duncan, and Select McDonald's with a major expansion announced last week. This is what goes into an Impossible Burger. We first met the founder and CEO of Impossible Foods, Pat Brown, back in 2017 when he showed us how he uses liquid heme made from soy to make their burgers bleed like real beef, the same key ingredient in the new pork. We caught up with him in Las Vegas where he told us he chose to do pork after beef because it's the most consumed meat in the world. It's simple ingredients that come from the farm, that come from nature. Uh, nothing weird is done to them and uh, that are combined to produce a product that we think is like more than the sum of the parts. His larger focus is pork's negative environmental impact. When you eat a pound of pork, it's the equivalent of driving about 17 miles in a typical American car. That's because of greenhouse gas emissions like methane released into the air during meat production. As for your personal health, nutrition specialists like Dr. Vijaya Sarampudi at UCLA say there's no conclusive research yet on whether these juicy alternatives are good for you. Am I eating something healthy? Not necessarily. And why not? Because it is still technically processed. You still have, you know, the same degree of fat. You have more salt in it. Sermpudi says meat substitutes like Impossible are so new to the market that more research needs to be done. We want to know things, long-term things. Does it affect our cholesterol? Does it affect our blood pressure? Does it affect cancer risk? Does it affect um, heart disease risk? So bottom line here, what's your recommendation? So I think anything is fine in moderation, but ideally you would focus on a plant-based diet where you have whole vegetables, whole fruits, whole grains. Is there a downside to consuming impossible meat or plant-based meat? If you love meat and you're going to buy meat, you're much better off from a personal health standpoint, from a public health standpoint, from an environmental standpoint, from an animal welfare standpoint, buying impossible pork or the impossible burger. If you want a carrot, eat a carrot. An ongoing debate leaving consumers with plenty to chew on. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Does it count if it's a watermelon margarita? Mm. Always trying to beat the system. I'm just asking. <laughs> you gotta love Bobby Thomas. There are people watching that understand. I'm here with one of my favorite people, Joy Bauer, the one and only, who is beautiful on the outside, but just as beautiful on the inside. Thank you for that. But you also know so much about what to put inside to help us feel just a touch mm -hmm. prettier on the outside. And let's talk about water. So water is great for three different reasons. First is it helps to flush out the toxins that we have within our body. The second thing is that it helps to circulate nutrients and oxygen to all of our skin cells. And it also helps to plump up and 
firm your skin so that it looks smoother, it looks clearer, it looks truly more beautiful. I'm gonna try to get more glasses of water in, but if I can't drink the water, how else can I sneak water into my well, diet? Well, there's, there's a lot of ways that you can sip water. Reduced sodium broth is fantastic because it's all water and it's got a little bit of flavor. And because you don't want to get a lot of salt along with the water, I would say definitely look for lower sodium brands. And you could do vegetable or you could do chicken. It's all great. Another great thing is green tea. Not only is it giving you great hydration for beautiful skin, but you're also getting antioxidants within the green tea that are fantastic for a glowing complexion. So starting with some fruits, we have grapefruits, mm -hmm watermelon and strawberries. They are about 90% water. Watermelon is one of my personal favorites. Is this too sugary? Is there enough water in it? It is not too sugary. It's got something called lycopene, which is an antioxidant that's really good for your skin, and it also has a lot of vitamin C. So fruits have a lot of water. What about vegetables? So some vegetables have even more water content okay. than the fruits we just went over. If you could imagine cucumbers, lettuce, and celery have about 95% water. So I'm gonna show you how to make, I call it a cucalicious dip. This is an easy thing. So okay. this is just yogurt. Okay. So it's a single six ounce container of any yogurt that you want. I'm using a Greek yogurt because you get like, like a huge punch of protein and it's thicker and it's mm -hmm. tangier. So now what we're gonna do is grate okay. a cucumber. It could be a regular sized cucumber or one of these minis. And why do you grate it? Just to get the different texture? Exactly. Okay. And it's perfect for a dip then. And I can see the water right on the grater. That's right. Wild. And I keep the skin on because you're getting some fiber with that as well. You know, we might as well go for the gusto. Okay. So why don't you mix that okay. up? I'm gonna wash my hands. So really we're creating like a tzatziki sauce, right? Mm. My parents had a Greek restaurant forever, so I'm familiar. Oh, and I perfect. didn't know this was so good for you. And I'm going to put in a little ground cumin because okay. everything's better with cumin. Do you agree? I will take your word for it. Do you like garlic? I do love garlic. Okay, good. A little bit of garlic. Okay. Nice color, right? Mm hmm And a pinch of some ground black pepper. And a little bit of kosher salt. Great, and now the last thing I'm going to do is I'm just gonna chop in some cilantro. But really, you can make this recipe whatever you want. You could put in dill, fresh mint, anything goes, even oregano. Okay, beautiful foods. There you go, mix that in. Okay. It's pretty, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Here we go. There you go, your girls' night in, or your spa day. You could do this, Get guys. This it's dip. so simple. It's so simple. Let me grab one. Let me test it out for you. <laughs> so this is loaded with extra water because of the cucumber. We have the cucumber within, and then we're dipping it with celery and cucumber. Okay. So right. load up on your veggies. Mm. Cheers. Cheers. Welcome to our today all day special, The Upside. I'm Craig Melvin. The Upside is all about uplifting people and stories that show the true grit of the human spirit. And after spending an amazing two weeks at the Tokyo Olympics, we couldn't help but think about the power of sports. So today we're going to shine a light on how sports changes lives, helping folks overcome obstacles both on and off the field. Now, traditionally, the sport of rowing isn't known for its diversity. While talent is everywhere, access is not. But that didn't stop the students of St. Benedict's Prep in Newark, New Jersey. With the help of a dedicated coach, they changed all that. And as you'll see, the school has a, a bit of a habit of turning tradition on its head. Spending a day at St. Benedict's Prep in Newark, New Jersey will leave you nothing short of inspired. You're a winner. You're a winner. Go. 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 Heart and hustle are everywhere. Thanks on three. One, two, three. Best. On campus and four and a half miles off. Yes, you know, that's what I want. On the Passaic River. No, you're making a change if it feels uncomfortable. That's where you'll find Coach Craig White. I graduated from St. Benedict's. I live in Newark. I've lived in Newark my whole life. Uh, what makes St. Benedict's Prep different is everything. 
And he's not kidding. The students take charge here. So when one asked him to start a crew team, he had no choice but to take it up with the headmaster, Father Leahy. And I told him, I said, no, a crew's too expensive, Greg. We can't do crew. One day I was walking around the property, walked through a door and tripped over an erg. So I called Craig. I said, Craig, what the heck is the erg doing here? Oh, somebody just gave it to me. Here I have some story, right? The ergs kept multiplying. And then one day I look across my room in the monastery, just thinking, eight-man shell. Craig, he just ignored me. So now we have a, you're here doing a story on the crew team. What started as a leap of faith is now a 10-year success story. We're consistently getting higher and higher and higher and higher up the rankings. Our kids this year, they advanced to the semifinals at Stotesbury Cup for the first time in, in a decade. Well, I, I never really imagined that I could be a part of something so big. When I got to the team, I was just like surprised that, wow, this actually exists. And like, it was really one of the first things that I, I could dedicate myself to. That dedication got Yamil, Jaden, and Alvaro a ticket to U.S. Rowing's Olympic Development Program. And now, they're dreaming bigger than they could have ever imagined. My dream one day is to make the Olympics. I would love to go to the Olympics. My dream is to make the Olympics. If one of my kids is on the Olympics, I'm probably gonna break the television. You know, screaming and throwing stuff, but it's, it's great. Do we have a future Olympian in this group? Yes. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. While gold medals would be nice, Coach White says it's the character building on and off the water where the real magic happens. Every time I have to do something hard, I like think about it. Like, I've been in the erg for like 90 minutes straight before. I just think about that and be like, okay, I can do this. If I can do that, if I can do 90 minutes in the erg, I can definitely do this. What we do on the water every day, without question, changes lives. When the kids come to us and they're a part of the team, they change for a couple of reasons. One, first off, they learn and they understand that I have power to make my life better. It's not just about the sport, you know? It's about, am I making myself better? Uh, not just interpersonally, but am I becoming a better athlete, holistically better? Is my technique improving? Are my grades improving? Is my relationship with my family improving? And every generation of kids, every year, they raise the bar, and they do that themselves. But they'll tell you, none of this would be possible without Coach White. He's like the guy. You know, he's just the guy. He's just he, a big guy. He does, a, he does a lot for us. He sacrifices a lot for he's us. Like a, he's kind of like a second father to me. These kids, these kids are so grateful for everything. They're grateful for each other. They're grateful for the experience. And you can literally ask them to move, move mountains, and they'll do it. From changing lives to changing the world of rowing, to recognize the value of diversity in the sport, Coach says he's just getting started. The rowing community in our country in particular struggles. Um, it struggles to be able to diversify the sport. You know, our kids get hooked the minute that they get in the boat. So all we have to do is to provide access, you know, open a door. And then once the kids walk through it, they, they want to do it every day. I want these kids to have whatever they want. I want them to be able to grow into the world they have the grit, they have the intelligence, they have the work ethic. So to be able to share myself and my family and my time with these kids, to be able to watch them grow, to be able to do what was done for me to another generation of, 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 of young people, what else is there? Stay connected and stream the news you need with Xfinity X5. Our top story is unfolding right now. The fast speed you depend on. We begin with breaking news right now in Florida. And a reliable connection for all your devices. This story matters to all of us. Whenever and however you watch. A bite-sized mix of everything you love about all four hours of our show, but half the calories. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. With Xfinity X5. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Let's go. 
And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd Cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Skateboarding made its Olympic debut this year, but it's a 46-year-old newcomer and mom of two who has everyone talking. Known by her alter ego, Auntie Skates, Orby Roy's uplifting and inspiring skating videos have gone viral on TikTok, proving she's not your average auntie. When I get on a skateboard, it is the most liberating feeling I've ever experienced. And whatever problems that I'm having in my life, they just go away. Yay! <laughs> and when I get in a, in a sari and I start flying in the bowl, it's just really fun. I feel very lucky that I found skateboarding. I could have lived my whole life and never found it. Meet Orby Roy, also known as Auntie Skates on social media. She's a 46-year-old mother of two who started to skateboard just three years ago. When I started skateboarding as a family, I started an Instagram account just to track our progress for fun and feel good about us as a family skateboarding together, and it made me really happy. Then in January of 2021, it was a particularly dark period for, I think, a lot of people with COVID, and everybody just seemed depressed. People weren't even hiding it anymore, and myself included. I think that, that mental health, everybody's mental health was suffering. So I created Auntie Skates as a way to spread joy and positivity. I started a TikTok account. I had never even been on TikTok before, and I took a character, Auntie, and I just started posting really fun, uplifting videos. I had created the character Auntie some time ago in improv, and I may or may not have been disciplining my children with that accent. Hello, everybody. It's Auntie. I'm out in the cold weather in Canada to do a rock to fakey. First try. Ready? That was one piece of it. And the other piece of it was I, I was getting on Instagram more, and I started following young South Asian women and I started to notice that they were complaining often about auntie. And every culture has that toxic person in their lives, the person that tries to bring them down, the, the person that's always judging them, you know, the person that says, why aren't you married yet? And every culture has that, my culture included. So why not be the person that builds people up? And that's why Auntie Skates was created, specifically. And it wasn't just her age that made her stand out in the skate park. As a South Asian woman, I do wear traditional dress often for special occasions, weddings. Any chance I can to wear a sari, I will wear it. A sari is a traditional Indian outfit that women wear, and it's a long piece of cloth that you wrap around yourself. It comes in really bright, vibrant colors. I like to have fun as a skateboarder. I like to have fun as a mom. And I took Auntie Skates a little bit further, and I put Auntie in a sari, and I skated the bowl. Orby didn't realize the impact that she would have on others. It was the comments that people were leaving from the 40-year-old man who used to skate as a kid and bought a board because of me to the young Indian girl in, in, in a village in India who said, if you can do it, I can do it. It resonated with so many people in so many different ways. Roy was always someone that took risks, even when she was a young girl. My parents are immigrants. They came to this country in the 60s. And I think when they came to this country, they had culture shock. They didn't really feel comfortable raising a daughter in a new, more liberal country. And I think what happened was they kind of doubled down on their old school values. They were doing what they thought was best for me. And they were setting some standards based on their own fears. And the great thing about my parents is that they learned from their mistakes. Yes, I got a computer science degree. Yes, I worked on Wall Street. But that day that I called my father and told him I was walking away from this job, and he supported me, and my mom supported me, I knew that I would always have my parents' support no matter what crazy thing I did. And with Auntie Skates, 